Out to center. This is Kranz. It's way back. It is gone. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today I have on one of the most tenured players in all of Major League Baseball history. His career spanned over 25 seasons from 1986 to 2012. He is one of just 18 pitchers to record a win against all 30 teams. He is one of just 31 players to have played a game in four separate decades. He is the only pitcher to throw a shutout in four separate decades. And he is just the third pitcher to win 100 games after turning 40 years old. This is Mariners legend and Hall of Famer, Jamie Moyer. This is a three hour podcast spanning his career and much more. We get into his experience in being teammates with Nolan Ryan, Pedro Martinez, Randy Johnson, being a part of the playoff teams with the Mariners in the late 90s, being a part of that historic 116 win team in 2001, as well as winning World Series with the Philadelphia Phillies in 2008, the team that he grew up rooting for. First of all, a big shout out to Austin and Dev's Coffee Bar. He started the Failure Podcast just a year ago, created this awesome podcast studio, hoping to do a lot more podcasts in his setup. Make sure to go check him out across social medias on the Failure Podcast. Also make sure to check out Black Label Supplements, a third party tested athlete approved supplement company. They've got awesome products. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And if you want to rep your favorite team, including the Seattle Mariners, but not wearing a jersey necessarily, then go check out Baseballism, the official lifestyle brand of baseball. Go to Baseballism.com, use code COUCHGM for 15% off. And to take your home office or man cave a step up, go check out the Glance LED panel. Visit glance-led.com and use code COUCHGM for 15% off. And as always, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM, as I am a mortgage lender during the day. You can visit lenderconnorweb.com to get in touch. And with that, let's get into the podcast with Jamie Moyer. And you go to Cooperstown, and to, for me, I love Cooperstown. I mean, obviously the museum's there, but you go to Cooperstown and you feel like you've gone back. Are we good? We're good. Sweet. 30 years in life. The pace is slow. They have a diner. I mean, it's just really, you know, the, there's yeah. a hotel on a lake, the Otisaga Hotel, and that's like when they have the Hall of, Hall of Fame induction, MLB the take, outdoor thing takes with that the stage. whole hotel. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's in that hotel, it's all Hall of Famers, their families, and it's blocked off and locked up and, and they have their own space. And it's this little town comes to life. Yeah. Because thousands of people go there for the inductions, right? For their sure. team or their player or whatever. And, yeah, it's I've been there. I went for uh, when Junior got inducted. Okay. And when Edgar got inducted, I'm sure I'll go Felix. next year when King Felix. Ichiro gets. Oh, Ichiro, okay. I mean, he hasn't – he's not on the ballot. I think he's – on the ballot for the first time this yeah, coming year. Right. Yep. He'll probably be a first ballot. Yeah, it's a walk in. Yeah. I don't know about Felix. I, yeah, I, that's that's where there's I, a debate. I, I sure. mean, yeah, he won a, one Cy Young, right? The year he was like yeah. nine and 14 with a two something ERA, right? The run support. Yeah. Um, I believe. Well, I know he won a Cy Young then, but and you know he was dominant, but so was Randy Johnson, mm -hmm. right? But Randy Johnson went on to pitch in a World Series and you know do a lot of other things. I don't, I don't know. See, for me, the Hall of Fame is a cumulative thing. Yeah, and I don't know where it's going to go because numbers are going to start changing or have been changing. How the game was played and, back then right, compared to how right. it is now. So is totally different. how does how does that the voters, which is the media, which kind of agree and disagree with. Um, but what are those standards? It used to be 500 home runs, 3000 hits, 300 wins. You were an automatic. Nobody's going to win 300 anymore. Yeah. I doubt probably gonna... not. You might get the 500 home runs, probably not 3,000 hits. 
so because careers are shorter right right so what i was starting to say it's somewhat of a cumulative thing right yeah because you got to accrue and accumulate numbers to get to 500 3000 to do it consistently for a long time right yeah. so i think they look at the bulk of your work now and you know they're talking you know they've had they've talked about Kurt Schilling and I'm not talking about off the field. I'm talking about just on the field. Mm-hmm. You know, people are like he's a Hall of Famer. Well, he he was great in the playoffs. And he was a really good pitcher, but he's fallen short. Well, we all know. I think I know why he's fallen short because of his mouth, mm-hmm. right? Should that be that way? I don't know. Yeah. But it's you know, that's how it is. Yeah. Um, trying to think of other guys that. You know, Pedro. Oh, yeah. I mean, stupid dominant. Yeah. Like, he should I when I played, we used to joke in the dugout, you know, we'd sit together with, as pitchers and go, he needs to call up to the next level, <laughs> right? Above the MLB. R- right. Roy Halladay <laughs> was in that, yeah. you know, he had a span of time. Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens. Um, Cliff Lee. Mm-hmm. You know, Cliff Lee didn't do it long enough. I mean, there's some of my favorites, right? I love to watch pitch, right? Because what they did was pretty special. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to play with both Cliff and Roy in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just professionals, you know, hardworking yeah. guys. And, you know, and, you know, you look at Roy's situation, he got called up as a young kid and struggled mightily. Sent him back to A ball. And he A-ball. recreated himself and turned him into what what he turned into. Yeah. Which is you don't see that. A lot of times when they go back to A ball, yeah, they don't resurface. Done. Yeah. <laughs> right? They just don't resurface. Or if they do, they don't come back to what the potential was. What was expected of them? Right. At the yeah, the expectation. Yeah. So that was pretty cool, I think. Um, yeah. You know, it's unfortunate he's passed away and right. you know all that, but yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to get into all of that. You know mm-hmm. how the game was played back when you first started mm-hmm. to ten years in to mm-hmm. when you retired to how it's played now. Right. But let's go ahead and start back with your story with how you got into baseball, how you got into sports initially. And kind of take it from your childhood up to when you... Okay. Um, well, you know, I you know, grew up in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, my dad played fast pitch softball at that time. Okay. He, was, he played hardball. Um, he was a shortstop in hardball. And fast pitch softball, he played on a church league team and an industrial league team, so... I grew up, you know, before little league age, going to you know those types of practices and games, mm-hmm. and that's basically how I grew up. And one time, once I got to that seven, eight, nine year old range, you know, they'd let me on the field to shag in the outfield, and mm-hmm. we they the big the big game pregame thing was pepper. Okay, yep. So I remember playing a lot of pepper with those guys, yeah, and. Um, and then I became, you know, was allowed the Bat Boy and things like that. And I just, I loved it. I, so then I became, you know, I was eight years old, started in Little League and um, loved the game, playing with your buddies. You know, you got your jeans on, you know, and your t shirt mm-hmm. and your hat. You know, you think you're the guy, the dude, <laughs> right? And you're playing locally, you know, and it was, you know, we didn't, there was no travel ball when I grew up, right? Yeah. It was just, we were in, in different times, right? It hadn't been, that hadn't evolved yet. And, uh, you know, it was just fun, you know, and that's why I think we play sports when we're young. We enjoy it. It's fun. You're with your buddies. Uh, I hated to lose. I cried when we lost, you know. I mean, it was, uh, I feel like, you know, looking back on it, you know, for whatever reason, I had passion for the game of baseball. And I think as I grew, that passion became more and more and more, and uh, or more prevalent. And yeah, I played 
bitty basketball. I played midget football, played junior high football, got to high school, didn't play football. I was pretty small at that point in time, but really liked baseball because I was successful in it. And then actually I'd, in the fall uh, we're in Pennsylvania where I grew up, they had golf as a sport. So I played golf in the fall, basketball in the winter, and baseball in the spring. And the basketball, I enjoyed basketball, but basketball for me was to get in shape for baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we, again, we, were, we weren't really good in high school. Uh, we were okay, but we weren't really good. How big was your high school? Uh, well, I think my graduation class might have been around 320. Okay. So it wasn't Relatively huge, small. but it wasn't, you know, 15. Right. Right. Um, but, yeah, we, we were decent. And, but then in the summer, um, you know, we uh, our American Legion was pretty good. And my, as I was saying, my dad coached me starting at eight years old all the way through American Legion baseball. Okay. And American Legion baseball was a big thing back in the day, right? Again, there still wasn't travel baseball it was starting to happen but people didn't know what it was and who you know how to get involved around where i grew up um so yeah it's just again we played to to enjoy it and then uh, i wasn't that great of a student in high school Uh, i didn't apply myself well enough and um but my dream was to play baseball and, and play it professionally and uh in high school you know i had Pretty good high school career. Um, I probably pitched twice a week, um, and you know, was told you don't throw hard enough. You're too small. You know, I was always told the things that I couldn't do, mm-hmm. rather than you know. But it was also people were just giving their opinion, and then I didn't really understand what an opinion was. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, ended up going to St. Joe's University in Philadelphia. And, uh, again, I had to go to night school to get into the day school because my grades weren't good enough. Proved that and uh, had a pretty good three years at St. Joe's and got drafted in the sixth round by the Chicago Cubs. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 1984, and, uh, you know, took on that experience not knowing where I was going, what I was doing. I had never been personally, west of the Mississippi uh, when I signed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a mini spring training in Mesa, Arizona. Okay. That was where the Cubs were at that time. And uh, first team I played on was in Geneva, New York. Um, Short season A ball. And the next year I went to uh, Winston-Salem in the Carolina League. Played there a half a year and... Went to Double A for the re- remainder of that season in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Uh, so that was basically my first full year. I got to Double A, mm-hmm. and again, there were no top ten lists of you know pitchers, okay. players in the organization. I mean, I think the organization had an idea yeah. of players, but it wasn't you know they, there wasn't a pecking order. Was there any transparency through the? you know, in saying, hey, this is kind of where you're at compared to these guys, if you do X, Y, and Z. Then- no, you know, and the, what I have found or learned in, in in the minor leagues is when they start making your promises, run, <laughs> right? Because you can't, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? let alone next week, next month, or the end of the season, where, you know, wherever it might be. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, like I said, I that would have been 85 um, if we I, can back up just a uh-huh. second, back to sure, high school. Sure. So when you were 18, the Philadelphia Phillies ended up going and winning the World Series in 1980. Yes. <laughs> and I heard or I saw that yeah. you played hooky in high school. Yes, to, I did. Oh, that was and... probably the only time I played hooky in high school. Okay. And uh, I skipped school. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with a bunch of buddies. And, you know, Philadelphia was like... You know, for me, at that time in my life, Philadelphia was like... You know, compared to where we are right now, it was like going to, from here to California, mm-hmm. right? It was an hour away, but we didn't go to you know to Philadelphia that much. And um, as a kid growing up, right? And so we, I think we took the train uh, down to Philadelphia, and we went to the parade, the Phillies parade, and that was a, a great experience. Um, yeah, and who would have thunk 
you know, in 2008. Right. You know, how many years later, you know, was on a World Series champion and uh, was in the parade. Yeah. So in my home, you know, in my home city. So that was that was a, a great experience. And we'll yeah. get into it in a bit. But one of the guys that you were looking up to, you know, that was playing on the Phillies. You ended up Steve de Carlton. debuting against. Yep. yep. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty exciting, pretty ironic. Uh, and I had met Steve uh, when I was in college at St. Joe. Uh, my coach uh, had set a little private session up with, uh, at the time, Claude Osteen, who was the pitching coach with the Phillies. And uh, he worked with me a little bit down underneath a veteran stadium. And um, I threw a little bit. He kind of gave me some pointers and tips and uh, set up to uh, to meet Steve Carlton. So that was, that was you know, at that point in time, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, in 1986, my major league debut in Chicago um, was against my boyhood idol, Steve Carlton, and we won the game. So, yeah. I mean, right then, if you would have asked me right then and there, you know what, that was my career, <laughs> you know? I mean, we're good. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like one of those pinch me moments. Yeah. Right. And I, you know, I look back in my career and I, I had a lot of those kind of moments, you know, being a part of uh, Cal Ripken's streak uh, when in games played. Uh, when he tied and beat Lou Gehrig, I was a teammate. Um, I was a teammate to Andre Dawson when he signed a blank contract, blank contract. and went out and had an MVP year. Uh, that was pretty phenomenal to watch, and was a teammate of Nolan Ryan's when he got his 300th win, his 5,000 strikeout, and I believe it was his seventh no hitter. Wow! So you know it's again I, just a teammate, right? I wasn't a part of any of it, but I was a part of it, you know, because I had a uniform on and I mm -hmm. sat in the same bench. You know, we were in the same locker room. Best seat in the you house. Know, we were rubbing elbows, and you know, and and you know, these guys were you know, my workmates, mm -hmm. right? You know, and three great examples, and probably you know, people I've had the question asked many a times in my career, who's your favorite player that you played with, and it was all three of them, and it wasn't for me, it wasn't what they did on the field speaks for itself. For me, it was more about the example they set and how they treated me as a human being. And uh, I learned so much from the three of those people, as well as many other coaches, managers, and teammates that I had. Uh, but those three guys just, you know, they handled adversity really well. But on top of all of it, they handled success unbelievably well. And they were very humble in both situations. And I think that was a big stepping stone for me. Um, you know, I'd, again, looking back, obviously we're reflecting here. So looking back on my career, um, you know, in the beginning, I didn't have a great deal of success. And but for whatever reason, the Cubs kind of stuck with me. You know, I kind of moved through the Cubs organization rather quickly, um, and wasn't you know. Again, a top 10 prospect or anything like that. I was a left-handed pitcher. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's kind of how I looked at it. And I followed another left-handed pitcher through the organization who I thought was really good. And I bypassed a couple guys who I thought were way better than me. And I kept moving. And some of those guys didn't. And mm -hmm. I, you know, who was it for me to question, right? But looking back on it, I'm like, you know, why, you know, there was something holding them back. Uh, but I got opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And uh, like you said, I, I didn't have consistent success. And, uh, you know, I kept getting the opportunities, right? Which I don't have an answer for that right now, other than I felt like I was a pretty good person. I worked hard, mm -hmm. kept my nose clean, and, uh, you know, it worked. Early on in your career and when you first, you know, were making your debut, were you able to stay pretty level-headed across starts um, compared to some of those uh, guys? Maybe you know, that the, was part of it? I, I, you know, publicly I felt like I did. But inwardly, you know, dealing with uh, failure yeah. and losses and inconsistency, mm -hmm. 
that was a big struggle for me, a big struggle for me. And uh, in, well, I'm trying to think of the year, uh, 91, I had the great opportunity to meet a gentleman by the name of Harvey Dorfman, mm -hmm. uh, who wrote a book with another gentleman by the name of Carl Keel, The Metal Guide to Baseball. And it's a book that's out there, you can find on the internet. Um, I want to say, <clears throat> for me, I'm not a big reader, but the best book I've ever read on baseball, and it worked on from here up. There was, you know, it wasn't, didn't teach you how to throw a curveball. It didn't te teach you how to throw 95. Mm -hmm. um, it was more the mental part of the game. And read the book, thought I understood it pretty well, and then had a great opportunity to go spend two and a half days with Harvey at his home at the time in Prescott, Arizona. And boy, he really got me to kind of step outside of my body and kind of think and look at who I was. And it forced me to change a lot of the way I did things or the way I thought about things, mm -hmm. my mental approach to things, and focus on what I could control. Right. And as we say today, you know, close out the noise. And I'll tell you what, it took some time, but it changed my career. It changed my life. It really did. Um, I had to work at it. And I worked at it for the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I've, I've played with so many more people in my career that I believe had far more talent than I did. But injuries, their mental approach, uh, the distraction, uh, one of those, two of those, all of those, mm -hmm. uh, kept them from the consistency that they needed to have. Um, you know, I really didn't, you know, throughout my career, I didn't really play on any winning teams. My first seven, eight years in Major League Baseball, we never were, if we were over 500, it was barely. Um, so, I, you know, I saw the downside of that, mm -hmm. right? And then came to Seattle, uh, pitched for the Mariners in uh, 96. Six, I believe it was. I got traded from Boston at the trading deadline for Darren Bragg. And, uh, you know, there was a little more life. There was uh, a little more. The attitude of winning was more prevalent. And, you know, in that late 90s to into the early 2000s, mm -hmm. winning was, it was exciting. Yeah. And all of a sudden I started to see the difference Right. Mm -hmm. And the energy that comes with that, and the momentum that comes with that and and the fans supporting uh, in a positive way rather than in a negative way. Right. right. And uh, well, it was it was it was uplifting and uh, boy, it, it kind of energized me It energized my career. And it, so all of those experiences that I had early in my career, I think I really benefited from, mm -hmm. and not just my own personal experiences, but again, watching the people around me, people across the field, my own teammates, um, you know, it's the on the job training is really kind of what it is. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like it, it really looking back on it really, uh, really, I really benefited from that. And then in 2006, I got traded to the Phillies in August, and I basically was going to retire at the end of that season. Um, you know, we as it, in the Mariners organization, we had you know we got older. Uh, they made some trades. You know, the, the baseball stuff, mm -hmm. right? Happens, right? Life happens, and uh, boy, it was back to that those losing ways, and it just makes the season feel like it's two hundred and fifty games instead of one hundred and sixty-two. Yeah. And I was getting a little bit older, and I was going to retire at the end of that 2006 season. Went to Philadelphia, and we fell short of the playoffs that year. But the energy in the clubhouse, the energy during the game, um, kind of revitalized me. And 07, you know, we fell short. You know, we ran into the 
lightning hot uh, Colorado Rockies who cut right through us in the playoffs. I, I believe they swept us. And uh, 2008, there was just a demeanor to that team, that World Series team. You know, I didn't know that we were going to win a World Series. But in spring training, well, I'll put it this way. When we lost in 2007, I can still remember the somberness in our clubhouse mm -hmm. in Colorado when we lost that third game. The anger, uh, the disbelief. Uh, literally, there were people crying. Yeah. Um, and it left a really, really bad taste in our mouths. Do you think that motivated players oh, to work that much harder in the offseason? Most off definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Because going into that 2008 season or spring training, as people were coming to camp, there was a different vibe. Mm hmm. There was a different feel. But, you know, like you said, you didn't know you were going to win a World Series. You got to go out and play your 30 spring training games and your 162 game schedule, right? But there was just a different vibe about that season. And uh, Charlie Manuel was our manager and, you know, great leader and a great baseball man. And, you know, we had, you know, Chase Utley and Ryan Howard and Jimmy Rollins. Holiday. Uh, Roy wasn't there Roy yet. Roy wasn't there. No, okay. no, no. Roy wasn't there at that point. Um, and you know, we we you know we started to win. You know, our, the city backed us. You know, Philadelphia is a great place to play when you're winning, right? It can be a tough place to play when you're losing in any sport. Um, but there was a lot of energy around all of that, and we just we, we you know we got on a roll and we played and we played and we played and. You know, made it to the playoffs and, you know, ended up playing, I believe it was Milwaukee, the Dodgers, and then the Rays. Um, and we beat the Rays in five games. And weather wasn't uh, that when we first, we split in, uh, in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And then we came back and won three straight in Philadelphia. And the weather was, you know, we had delays and we actually had one game that was stopped and we finished it the next day. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, <clears throat> that to me, that's what you play for. Right. I mean, that's everybody, it should be everybody's goals to play in a world series or win a world series. So, um, you know, I was a lot older at that point in time. Uh, but what, what a great, great experience and to do it, you know, feel like you're doing something as a team, everybody's contributing, but you're doing it as a team, uh, was quite special. And then Oh nine, we had another really good year and then lost to the Yankees in the World Series. So you were thinking about retiring after 2006, mm -hmm. and then you felt the energy, and that's kind of what mm -hmm. drove you to continue yep. playing. Exactly. And then you win the World Series in 2008, and it's like, I can never retire at this point. It's exactly. like, I got to get back to that point. And there were a lot of questions even that night. So are you going to retire? Are you going to retire? You go out as a winner? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to savor this, yeah. but I want more of this. Yeah. Right. And my feeling was I, you know, I had a uniform on. I still felt like I was contributing. For me, it was about as long as you're contributing, why do you not, you know, why would you not, why would you quit? Mm -hmm. and, if, and, you know, body wise, yeah, I had some few more aches and pains, but, you know, figured out ways to, you know, my training changed a little bit. Recovery became way more important mm -hmm. as I got older. And, uh, yeah, I'm like, cause once you retire at that age, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, you know, I had run into a lot of old time players or retired people, players who have, who would say, you know what, you, you play till they tear the uniform off your back. Right. And I kind of, kind of agreed to that, but I also, as a couple years went on. I also felt like, you know, I want to I want to leave this game on my terms, not anybody else's terms. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like, you know, there was an injury in there, but uh, I kind of feel like I left the game uh, on my terms. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, the game was telling me it's time for you to go too. So, yeah. 
but you know, my last uh, my last six starts as a professional pitcher were in the minor leagues, mm -hmm. and I kind of look at that as I kind of left the game the way I came into the game, and it was okay. it was really it really allowed me to kind of step back and relive my early years mm -hmm. of my career and you don't know how, you, you i reminisce in those six starts reminisce good or bad i rem it brought back so many memories of being in geneva being in winston salem being in pittsfield being in des moines iowa um the early parts of my career and it kind of gave me the the space to kind of walk away feeling pretty good about you know what I was able to to do for myself as a, as a baseball player and how I was able to contribute to the teams that, that I was on yeah when you played with Nolan Ryan were you able to kind of pick his brain on his longevity throughout his oh, career yeah, yeah. and yeah. take we some of those we became pretty good friends okay uh, we would uh, go out for food sometimes after games and things like that um, you know our families were Decent friends. Uh, a lot of times, if his wife Ruth would go on a trip, um, his oldest son Reed was playing American Legion baseball, and he would stay back in in Arlington with my wife mm -hmm. um, while we were, you know, playing games on the road. So, uh, but yeah, we he was a, a a great man, not only on the field but off the field, and very easy to talk to. Uh, but just, you know, a lot of times it wasn't verbal. It was just watching, mm -hmm. watching how he handled himself. And, and, you know, he, at that time when I played with him, he was, wasn't a spring chicken either. <laughs> he was in his forties and, still and, throwing like and, and quite the 40? competitor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but his workouts were diligent, consistent. Um, and you know, he had great character. And like you said, he was one heck of a competitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, in 2010, uh, you have an injury with your elbow. Mm -hmm. And then that off season, you, you go play internationally and then you mm -hmm. tear your, your UCL. Yeah. So at that age, in that time in your career, what, you know, when the injury first happened, what mm -hmm. were you thinking? And then the, you know, well, I can, I can recount, you know, that season, uh, right before the all-star break, um, uh, several weeks before the all-star break, my elbow wasn't feeling real good. So we kind of backed off in my throwing and things like that. And, uh, you know, I was able to pitch how effectively I was or how effective I was probably not as effective as I would have liked to have been. And then, um, right before the all-star break, uh, I believe I uh, I took a shot in my elbow and rested it for you know, a good, you know, used the all-star break as that mm -hmm. time to rest, but I also kept throwing a little bit over the break. Came back, um, first start back was in Chicago. Didn't pitch well. Um, and rem I remember during that game, not my elbow not feeling very good at all and going out the next day to play catch was the worst it ever had uh, up to that point had ever felt mm -hmm. and we went from chicago to st louis and our trainers are like you think you can pitch and i'm like well yeah i'm, I'm gonna pitch and well you know so we're i was getting treatment things like that i remember going to the bullpen in st louis and i was in a lot of discomfort but the more I, th it was, and it was really hot, the more I threw, the looser I got, yeah. the better I started to feel. And I felt like I was good enough to pitch. The first pitch of the game, hitter hit a comebacker to me. And when I threw the pitch, I was like, oh, that was painful. And it hit me a comebacker. And I'm like, I, c I can recount this like it happened yesterday. I caught the ball and my elbow was killing me and I'm like, how am I gonna throw this to first? And it was like, everything was in like slow motion. I lobbed it over, got the first out, 
Uh, next guy came up. Uh, I got him out rather quickly, but I wasn't able to pronate over the ball. That's where I was having discomfort. Next guy was Albert Pujols. I jammed him. He got a base hit. And the next I forget who the next guy was, and it was a fairly long at bat, and all I could do was throw fastballs. Mm -hmm. And I kept throwing. And I was like, to me, I was willing my way through the inning. Yeah. And like, get through this inning, get through this inning, because I, I didn't think I was going to be able to pitch. Got a, a deep fly ball to center field for the third out. I walked off the field, and in St. Louis, you kind of the dugouts are kind of not down the line, but not closer to home plate. And I walked into the dugout and I looked at Charlie Manuel and I said, "I'm done." And I had never ever done that in my life. You know, walked up to the manager, especially after the first inning, okay. and said I was done. So um, went in. Had a lot of discomfort, iced. I believe I flew home the next day, uh, got an MRI, and they did this gap test in my elbow with an ultrasound and determined I had like a grade two strain. So a grade, from the way I understand it, grade one is this, a grade two is this, and a grade three is a complete tear. Yeah. So I had a grade two strain. At the time, it's called the DL. Now it's called the IL. Right. Uh, put me on the deal, and um, I didn't pitch for the rest of the year. Um, Were you trying to pick up a ball and throw it, at, you know, a month later to see no, if you were still no, feeling okay? I, or I just... was just in total rehab mode. Okay. Um, ended up not pitching the rest of the year, and then decided, well, how am I going to find a job next year? Right, because mm -hmm. I wanted to play, mm -hmm. and I felt pretty good. I was, you know, towards the end of the year, I was throwing, playing catch, playing long toss, you know, all the procedures that I needed to do, and started to throw bullpens. But I didn't know where I was competitively, so uh, I went to uh, the Dominican Republic and agreed to pitch three games down there: one inning, two innings, and three innings. First outing through one inning really good and the next outing I went out I think I threw two innings got through my two innings and the next outing I went out and I got into my second inning and I threw a pitch it's a right-handed hitter and I remember the ball basically going through the left-handed hitters batter's box and had excruciating pain was it a change up I, I, I don't recall the pitch and I was like, I can't throw. I looked in the dugout. The manager came out, took me out of the game. And from the time I left the mound and walked to the training room, I literally had a golf ball hanging off Man. the inside of my elbow. So I knew I had damaged it. To what extent, I don't know. And at that time, we were living in Florida, went home, had an MRI, and uh, it was a complete tear. But on top of it, I tore my flexor pronator, which is that muscle mass that mm. attaches from your forearm to your elbow. So not only did I tear my UCL completely, but I had a, a flexor pronator tear. So and you I were had, what age at the time? I was 47. 47. Yeah. And uh, had the MRI, went out to see Dr. Yoakum in LA and uh, I was sitting in the examination room and he walked through the doorway and the MRI was up on the wall across the room and he was stood in the doorway <laughs> and he goes, you tore that pretty good. I mean, just from there to there, he could tell that it was torn. And I said, yeah, I guess so. So he walked in and I had known him before, you know, when we would play in Anaheim you know, mm -hmm. the home team doctor always comes over to the visitor side. And um, so I'd never really been around him medically, but had been around him just to kind of small talk and talk mechanics and pitching and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, well, you know, I can fix that. Um, and, you know, you'll be able to play catch with your kids and throw batting practice and 
play golf and do just, you know, normal functional things. And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, well, yeah, I can, you're not going to pitch again. <laughs> I said, what? Challenge accepted. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly how I took it. He goes, well, I can repair both. But he said, I have a friend in New York at the hospital for special surgery, Dr. David Alchek. And he said he is right now the guy to, to do flexor, or flexor pronator repairs. He's had the most success. Um, I recommend you to go to him. So he called him and set up a, an appointment. I went up there and had it repaired, missed the 11 season, and then went back and tried to pitch with the Rockies in 12. And, you know, probably uh, we had a good team, but fairly young. I mean, there were was, there was some veterans on that club, um, but didn't, we didn't play well. And I was an old guy, not pitching well. So, you know, I won, ended up winning two games there, uh, got released in, I want to say, May, end of May there. And then I went and pitched back in Norfolk for three games. Actually pitched really well in Norfolk. Uh, that situation didn't work out. And then I came out to uh, uh, Vegas and pitched for the 51s, which at that time was a, an affiliate with the Blue Jays and didn't pitch particularly well. Mm -hmm. And that was right at the minor league all-star, right up to the minor league all-star break. And that's when I decided I'm done. Yeah, cool. So you, you mentioned that you talked to the doctor about mechanics and pitching. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, when you first were in high school, when you first got to the league, mm -hmm. um, how your pitching mechanics, how your style, how that all changed. And I'm curious, you know, what pitches you were throwing in high school, how you learned the different mm -hmm. pitching styles and Interesting, how to move yeah, the ball. Interesting, yeah, great question. Um, high school, I was fastball, curveball pitcher, and I had a big loopy curveball in high school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and in that era, you know, high school pitching today, <laughs> I mean, you, you go around and watch some high I'd school no kids pitch. Th they're throwing 95. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's pretty phenomenal what yeah. you see today. Um, we didn't see any of that. Every once in a while, there was a hard thrower, but a hard thrower was probably upper 80s, maybe touched 90 mm -hmm. uh, in, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Um, now it's, you know, if you're a really good high school pitcher, you're probably 95, 97. Yeah. Um, you know, with a hook or some sort of slider. So, yeah, I mean, in high school, if, if you had a curveball and you could get it over the plate, you're probably going to – and you could throw a fastball somewhere around the plate. Yeah. You're going to have some success. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, like I said, I had – as a junior in high school, I threw three no-hitters in a row. Right. But, you know, again, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> the weather's colder, things like that. And there's some really good baseball in Pennsylvania. Even then, there was good baseball. And there's some been some – really good baseball players to come out of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, went to college and uh, at St. Joe, and the mascot for St. Joe is a hawk. And it just so happened to be uh, the mascot was a baseball player. His name was Kevin Quirk. Okay. And uh, he was a... Uh, Oh, I believe he was a senior when I was a freshman. And he had a, he went on to sign with the Yankees and played in Oneana, New York. And when he came back, he taught me a changeup. So the mascot so, for St. Joe's yeah. is the one that taught you how to throw your Well, he up? was a pitcher too. Yeah. But yeah, he was also <laughs> he doubled as the as the mascot for the basketball team. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, it took me all fall just to figure out the grip. Yeah. I mean, we would call it catch, but it was really a game of chase because <laughs> whoever I was throwing to needed to be by a wall because I, I couldn't get it to them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but forced myself to learn that pitch. And, uh, you know, by the spring, I was decent with it. And into my sophomore year, it started to evolve. And uh, my junior year, you know, I could throw it. Not necessarily where I wanted, but I, I knew I could get it around the plate. Mm -hmm. 
and I had a, a, a nice speed variance. You know, it was probably 10 to 12, 12 miles an hour slower than yeah. my fastball. And it's a pitch that you didn't see a lot. So hitters, you know, look, if a hitter sees, even in high school and college, if hitters see a certain pitch enough, mm -hmm. they're going to figure out how to hit it, right? And, uh, yeah, so I, it, it, it just kind of developed for me. And I got into, you know, my first season in the New York Penn League, uh, I ended up breaking a strikeout record in really? the New York Penn League. And I'm, I wasn't a hard thrower. I mean, that's, you know, anybody who follows baseball knows that. You know, I would probably topped out at, or I sat at 83 mm -hmm. in my prime, 83 miles an hour. People are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know. The major league average then was about 87 miles an hour. Okay. So today it's 92 or 93 miles an right. hour. Right. So again, difference in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, but again, you know, you look, you look at relie and relievers in the game today versus the past. You know, a reliever that's throwing 95 to 100, he may pitch two days in a row, but right. very seldom will he pitch three days in a row. Mm -hmm. But go back. A few years, several years, you know, relievers were probably mid to upper 80s, 90, 91, 92. And they would, they, you know, three days in a row was a lot of work. Okay. Right. And, you know, I mean, I played in, in uh, Chicago. Lee Smith was our closer. He was probably 92 to 94. Really? Okay. And he was one of the top relievers in the game. Yeah. Right. But the, 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 the positive for Lee, especially when we played in Chicago, at that point in time, we didn't have lights. <laughs> and we only played during the day, obviously. And the shadows would come in. Yep. And, you know, the, sh the shadows would play havoc on, on the hitters. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we're able to use that to his advantage. But I don't know that he needed the shadows. I mean, he was, he was pretty good. Uh, but, yeah, and then so, as I said, you know, the changeup just started to evolve, and I started to learn how to use it as a weapon, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it just got better and better and better. And, you know, I got to the big leagues. I was successful with it, but I probably lost uh, lost faith in my fastball and didn't have the fastball location mm -hmm. that I needed and didn't pitch inside enough and made a lot of mistakes – on the inner third of the plate, okay, which is probably one of the reasons why I lead Major League Baseball in home runs given up with 522. <laughs> but I look at that and say, you know, I'm not proud of it, but you know what? To give up that many, I've had a lot of opportunity. That speaks to your tenure more right. than, more so than you know right. that you're just giving up bombs every right. day. And then you know, I learned how to fiddle with my with my two seam fastball to get it to sink a little bit. Um, as I got deeper into my career, I learned to cut fastball mm -hmm. and then learn how to utilize it to both sides of the plate. Um, my curveball was probably my worst pitch because in high school I could get away with that loopy curveball, not professionally. Yeah. And uh, I put so much time and effort into my changeup, my curveball probably went backwards more than forwards. So my curveball was a show pitch mm -hmm. if, I, if I even threw it. Get me over, yep. strike. And I learned to manipulate my fastball to both sides of the plate and pitch in more, use the cutter, you know, into righties, down and away from lefties, and then backdoor it mm -hmm. to the right-handed hitter or throw it off the hip of a left-handed hitter. Yeah. So basically, you know, if we have a plate, using my pitches on this side of the plate, making an X, and using my pitches on this side and making an X, and, you know, the thing that I learned over time, every human being has an ego, some sort of an ego. Some are bigger, some are smaller, right? But hitters have egos, <laughs> right? And that's what I learned. Hitters have egos. They hit to situations. They hit to counts. They hit basically um, off the pitcher. Or sometimes they hit off the catcher. You know, if the catcher ends up calling the game, you know, you can learn a lot from a from, you know, as hitters, you start thinking about what the catcher can't hit, and that's what he's going to call in tight situations mm -hmm. if the pitcher has that pitch. Interesting. So there's a lot of a lot of things going on inside of a game, right? 
Um, but yeah, you know, I learned that, you know, throw three change ups in a row. You know, people don't do that. Mm -hmm. Throw a change up inside to a right handed hitter. Throw a change up down and into a lefty. You know, places that you know you're not so oh, don't throw the ball there. Well, if you're if you're setting it up correctly, I believe you can if you locate the pitch, you can throw any pitch at any time. As long as it's located. Now in today's game that's a little different. When you're throwing 95, 97, 100 miles an hour, a lot of those guys do not consistently locate pitches, but they're relying on the velocity to overpower the hitter. Right. So it's a and that's what makes the game different. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make it better, doesn't make it worse. That's the game. Yeah. And that's the style. And that's kind of what baseball wants and I think baseball feels like they they have allowed this or created this and the baseball world has created this and I think it's kind of what they think the fan wants too and I think the fans the fans enjoy it and you know look early in my career there weren't radar ratings right up on the board you know in the 80s there was no such thing mm -hmm. right but in the 2000s you know they put up you know radar ratings so now people can see that it's a, it's you know it opens the game up to something different, right? Yeah, because now they're they're seeking or looking for the views, mm -hmm. and what gets the views is the high velocity, right. the right. the crazy breaking stuff, yep. the home runs, yep. all that. Yep. And then you know getting into speeding up the game with the pitch right. clock and exactly all these different things. Exactly. So well, and it's the world we live in. You know, yeah. we we live in a fast paced. World. You're looking for the clips on social media yep. that you can get get yep. out there. Yeah, you don't have to watch a whole game anymore, and then. Five minutes after the game, you can see the game in five minutes. Yeah, right. A full recap. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, baseball's come a long way. Society's come a long way. You know, and it's not for me to judge. It's, I was very fortunate to have had a, a, a long career, to actually even play, mm -hmm. but to have had a long career um, and to, to play with some of the people I played with and, and be, you know, this much of baseball history, I, I'm very proud of that, mm -hmm. um, but very respectful of it as well. Yeah. But you know, meeting some of the people that I've met, travel to some of the places I've traveled, um, it's it's been wonderful, yeah. wonderful. And by the time you retired, you had faced something like nine percent of all major league mm -hmm. batters yeah. that had or players that had mm -hmm. played in the game. Yeah, pretty cool. And again, you know, to me, I never played for the numbers. Um, but with longevity comes some of that, right? Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of old, you know, the word old comes <laughs> into a lot of the conversation. But, you know, the other thing that I learned that, you know, you don't want to pitch, you know, like you said, average velocity was 87. So I learned, I used to, you know, people would say, oh, you're slow. You don't throw the ball hard. Well, I don't want to be at the speed limit. You're either above it or you're below it. Mm -hmm. And I learned that being below, you know, and watching guys like Jimmy Key and Tom Glavin, uh, John Cerruti, um, boy, uh, I'm trying to, uh, lefty with the Cardinals, I can't think of his name right now. Uh, it was, uh, another guy, Frank Viola, you know, guys, you know, that I kind of looked up to. Um, Jimmy Key, uh, when he played with the Yankees in Toronto, when they'd come to Seattle and the Kingdom, their bullpen was down the right field line. And if he had a bullpen, I would sneak over during batting practice and you know, I was shagging, right? Yeah. Wink, wink, I was shagging, but I was standing behind him. Building his bullpens. Watching <laughs> what he was doing. Yeah. Or if Jimmy Key was gonna start a game in the Kingdom, I purposely came out in the dugout before the game and I watched everything he did from when he left that dugout to his warm-ups. Now, I was across the field, but I could kind of get an idea. So he was more of a command pitcher as well? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But he had a big curveball. Okay. And he was, you know, he, his uh, mechanics were a little more funky, um, but still he was, you know, an off-speed type of pitcher. Yeah. I, I'm curious to see your pitch grips <laughs> and your thought process when you're throwing each of these pitches. Um, well... I, I re heavily relied on a two-seam fastball. Um, every now and then, I'd bring my thumb up to the side. 
Um, sometimes it would help me, allow me to take some velocity off, mm -hmm. but it would allow me to pronate over the ball a little bit more. With the two seam. Okay. Yeah. And then I started fooling around. I call it a one seamer. So it would come off of the outside of my uh, middle fingertip. Obviously, my finger, my middle finger is the longest finger on my hand. Mm -hmm. So that's where the ball is going to come off of last. Right. So to me, you know, every pitch you throw comes from the same release point, but it's a matter of how it comes out of your hand. Right. So, you know, here's a four seam fastball. For me, a two seam fastball would be slightly inside the ball, off, right? Yeah. So I'm dominating the ball on the inside. Curveball is here. Mm -hmm. Slider's kind of in between a fastball and a curveball and a changeup. I was on the inside of the ball. Mm -hmm. So that all that little variation right there with and a cut fastball was just it was a little bit of a cock of my wrist and I would throw an off centered fastball. So you're throwing it you're releasing it like a four seam like ripping down with yeah. the cutter. But okay. it's but it's how it's you know yeah. where you're holding the ball and and you know and you know for me the seams are on a ball, yeah the seams hold the cowhide together. But this you know you learn to use the seams, the seams become your friend. Right. Right, and you utilize the seams. So for me, like I said, two seam fast. So I didn't throw a whole lot of four seam. I didn't, for me, at my velocity, I didn't want the ball to go straight. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to have some sort of movement. Right. But every now and then I would throw a four seam fastball. Um, and to me, that's just backspinning the baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, my curveball, the easiest way for me to remember was there's always writing on a baseball. So that faces the webbing of my hand and you know this is how I started to throw my curveball mm -hmm. uh, thumb on the bottom of the seam middle finger here on the seam and my pointer finger was my guide finger mm -hmm. but it was slow like I said it was loopy uh, as I went through my career I started to spike my yeah. curveball put my fingernail into the into the seam I got a little bit better spin but like I said I just didn't I don't think I had the hand speed to get the road the spin mm -hmm. or the what we call now the spin rate. Right. Right. Uh, my cut fastball, I fooled around with it. I initially started throwing it on this side of the ball here. Okay. And like I said, it was for me, it was if I had a fastball grip. So fastball for me was fingers were at 12 o'clock. So I would my my middle finger would be here on the seam. My, again, my pointer finger would be a guide finger. These guys would be underneath it. My thumb would be underneath it. But I would take my wrist from 12 o'clock and go to 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And now I throw off. You can, you can obviously see how the ball right. is going to come off of my fingers. Yeah. Then I got to the point where, let me see, this got a little loopy for me. So then I started to go, I'm trying to think. I went across the seams, I believe, it was this way, and I and I then threw it like that. Okay. Um, and then my changeup. For me, it was uh, these three fingers: pinky, ring, and middle. And I laid the open end. Of the, we, I always called this the horseshoe. Mm -hmm. The open end of the horseshoe was facing first base. Laid these three fingers on top. Okay. My thumb was underneath the ball as if I was throwing a fastball. And I took my pointer finger and I wrapped it over my thumb and there was a little space in here. And I would preset it in my glove with you know just a slight little cock or bend to my wrist and I would just stay inside the ball okay, and get over the ball. And I created downward and We'll call it fade, but you know, sinking action. Right. Yeah, I see a lot of guys. They hold it like a like a almost like a two seam fastball, but mm -hmm. with the circle change grip. Well, there's a lot of grips I've seen yeah, guys hold it with the seams. I've seen it with the horseshoe facing the other way. You know, for me, it's everybody's different. Hand size is different. Grip strength is different. Which finger is longest? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, finger pressure. Um, so there's not a right way, and there's mm -hmm. not a wrong way. It's right. your way, right? But it, you have to, you have to create a lot of repetition. I know when I was a kid, and even as a professional, I always had a baseball with me, mm -hmm. and I got in a lot of trouble at home because I'd lay in my bed and I'd just 
lay on my bed and spin the ball, but every now and then I'd get it solid and boom, <laughs> off the ceiling. So I left marks in the ceiling. But, uh, you know, when, when I was uh, on the road a lot, I had a ball, and I'd do the same thing just to feel the ball come on. You know, it's that yeah. feel. And you know what? When you, when you throw a pitch the right way, there's a feel to that. Mm -hmm. And to me, reiterate, you know, repeating that feel, and that's just a release. Now you, when you add your body movements, your mechanics to that, and when it all clicks, it's literally, for me, it's like taking a butter knife and cutting through just a warm pad of butter. Mm -hmm. It's just, or if you're a golfer and you, you hit that ball just right, and it's effortless and it goes, it's the same way with throwing a pitch yeah. for me. What drills did you do or how did you dial in your command growing up? Because, I mean. Well, I, uh, yeah, I, you know. It was like George see, Kirby, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He talked uh, in an interview recently that he throws into a nine pocket in the off season. He doesn't throw it to a catcher at all. Uh -huh. So he's just, look, throwing right. into one of those pockets mm -hmm. in. Well, I, yeah, a lot of it becomes your focus. And, you know, I think it's. The other part of it too is um, the consistent consistency for me. The consistency at home plate all starts with the repeatability of your mechanics. And I was a very mechanical guy. I, I really, as time went on, I really felt like I understood my mechanics most of the time. There were days I didn't have it, or you know, I was a little out of sync. Um, but being repetitive with it, you know, people ask, you know, well, why can't my son throw strikes or he doesn't throw enough strikes? Well, first of all, I ask how old. And, you know, that 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old kid, a lot of kids just aren't developed, mm -hmm. right? But we're expecting, you know, 100% accuracy. They're just not, their body isn't capable right. of doing that, right? So to me, go, that's where I say, go have fun. Right. And really for me, I didn't develop physically and I'm, you know, now I'm developing physically <laughs> right here, but, or have developed physically in my belly, but it's, you know, you got to have good leg strength. Yeah. And, and to me, your core strength, your abs, your low back. I mean, look, your biggest muscles in your body are from your knees to your sternum. Mm -hmm. So you work around that. I don't care if you're a hitter. I don't care. I mean, in basketball, you got to, you know, you got to have your legs. But when you shoot, uh, when you play golf, when you play football, I mean, it's all about having a sturdy base. So to me, it's it's the center of your body. What are you doing with the center of your body? Now, you, at a, a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old, what are you going to have them do? You know, a thousand sit-ups a day. I don't know that that's going to happen, right. right? So it should be fun. Because to me, as you get older, you get to that those teen years, that's when you start to work on the mechanical things and maybe start introducing some sort of a little bit of a weight program and things like that. But to me, it's 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 the fundamentals. For this sure. is baseball is a fundamental game for me. If if I'm gonna work with a kid, we're gonna work on fundamentals. And it's boring and it's redundant, right? But that's what you gotta do. I mean, I can remember, you know, minor leagues, major leagues, spring training. I feel like all we did was PFP, mm -hmm. pitchers fielding practice. Comebackers, covering first base, throwing the ball to second base, backing up. Base. I mean, stuff like that has to come second nature. As soon as the ball is hit, if it's not at you and it's to your left, as soon as you see that, you got to take two steps to first base. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you hesitate or you have to think about it, that, that hitter is going to beat you to first base. So it's some of these things just have to be ingrained into you that it becomes a natural thing. Right. right? And it's that way at every position. Right. If you're an infielder, mm -hmm. it's footwork and soft hands. Right. Yeah, you have to have arm strength. But guess what? You got to catch it first. Then you got to put your feet in the right position to be able to throw the baseball to wherever you're throwing the baseball, mm -hmm. right? So there's, and, and people, you know, well, I, you know, I want my kid to do this. Gonna, let's go back to fundamentals, right? right? Can he just do this consistently, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah, like you see in spring training with the Mariners, Perry Hill, he's their infielder. Oh, coach. wonderful. He's a wonderful infield guy. We see all, all the clips yep. of them, you know, standing against a wall. Yep. And he just throws the ball against the wall and doing different drills with yep. the infielders. Going back yep. to the basics, even if they've been in the big leagues for 10 yep. years, you start with yep. the fundamentals. Yeah, this is, this is not a game where uh, we're reinventing things you know, on how to catch the ball and things. Like that. I mean, that's been going on for over 100 years, right? It's just... It's how good are you at doing it? And, you know, as an infielder, it's all about making the average play, right? And I've heard that from when I was a little kid and till today. You know, I mean, if you make all the average players, you're going to be a really good player. Mm -hmm. And occasionally, if you make that outstanding play, you're going to catch somebody's eye. Right. right. And then you have the arm strength, and you know where to throw it and how to throw it. Is mm -hmm. it a soft throw? Is it, you know... Am I picking the ball up here as a shortstop and I'm going to fire it 15 feet to the, to the second baseman and turn double play? No, there's a way to do that. You pick it up, you stay down, and you kind of throw the ball uphill to him. Mm -hmm. Or am I close enough to shovel it to him so he doesn't get killed turning, you know, turning the double play? Right. Right? And now we've got rules where you can't do certain things. You're trying to protect players. But still, there's a way to do things, right? There's, and that comes footwork, soft hands, especially in the infield especially in the infield. And you look at the great ones, and you look at Ozzy Smith. <laughs> yeah, you were teammates and, with him. Yeah, I played with Ozzy. And, I mean, he was he was a magician. And, and you know, strong, uh, smaller, but strong for his size, really strong, and really good at what he did. But you know what he did every day? It's to start his ground ball work, on his knees, Somebody 30 feet away from him, boom, mm -hmm. boom, boom, just catching the ball, catching the ball, catching the ball on his, on his knees. And they'd move back, and they'd move back. And, and I've seen many players do it since. I'm sure a lot of players did it before. Um, I know Ron Washington, now the manager of the Angels, he's big on that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of other you know, coaches. Perry, I'm sure, is the same way, yep. as you were alluding to. So you know, it's those fundamentals Right? And again, like you said, it's boring. It's redundant. It's not flashy. It's like putting on your shoes, yep. tying, tying your shoes. It's just you have exactly. to do it to get Ex started. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so when I'm, up, when I'm up with the Mariners on the sidelines before the games, yeah, Perry Hill will be hitting ground balls mm -hmm. to the guys. They start yep. on, their, on their knees, yep. and then yep. they get up to a regular position, yep. and then they do infield yep. and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's like you said, it's, it's, it, and you, you get into that routine. And baseball is a big routine. You know, I, I know I was a huge routine guy. You know, when I walked in that clubhouse door, it was A, B, C, D. You know, what day is it? What am I doing this day? What am I doing the next day? You know, I mean, you know, for, for everyday players, it's got to be that same routine every day, yeah. whether you want to do it or not. Right. Right. Let's you go through your routine. Um, cause I, 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 heard you on an interview with, uh, the San Diego psychology d department or a school mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where you had laminated cards that you'd read yeah, before yeah. you go out on got the Got that out of Harvey's book. Yeah. Um, you know, that was more of the mental stuff, but there was a number grid that I used pregame to, to sit down and try to take my focus that was here and bring it into a smaller space. Um, I had some questions on a, on a note, note, note card that I would ask myself, about my perform, how I wanted to perform, reminders, breathing, mm -hmm. uh, consistent breathing, things, and then, you know, yes and no answers, but just reminders, right? And then thinking about problem solving and things like that, having an awareness, mm -hmm. and then you know what what probably is one of the harder or hardest things to do, and you hear people talk about it in all sports, slowing the game down, mm -hmm. right? The louder it gets, the more your adrenaline goes, the more excitement there is, the more emphasis is put on a pitch or a shot or a tackle or a swing, whatever it is, right? So how do you slow that down? What do you do? How do you, you know, I don't know that there's a book out there, but for me, it was learning how to have self-talk and talk like you and I are talking right mm -hmm. now. Instead of going, I, 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 you know, and, and now all of a sudden your breathing changes. Yeah. I have to do that. You know, no, 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 I can do this. That was one of the statements on my card. Okay. I can do this. I 
can do this. I know how to do this. Just do it. I mean, the famous phrase, right? Just do it. Yeah. But it is. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it's that simple. And again, trying to keep things simplified when things get stressful, right, is what we forget. So for me, it's like, how do I slow it down? Well, I got to breathe first. And then what's, what's the task I'm asking myself to do? I want to strike out. Well, that's my end result. How do I get to the strikeout? Well, if I'm going to strike somebody out, I have to throw three pitches, right? Yeah. So I have to focus on one pitch at a time, know my mechanics are there, and then locate my pitch, mm -hmm. right? But it's that self-talk. And then, again, it comes from that redundant repetition, that boring, redundant <laughs> repetition, right? But it is what it is in my book. Uh, and that's, for me, that's how I would do it. You know, slow yourself down. If you need to slow the game down. I played with a guy in Baltimore, a gentleman by the name of Doug Jones. And uh, was a reliever in Cleveland. I, th I think at the time, you know, early in his career, he was considered a hard thrower. But he also he had a really good changeup. And he pulled me aside once and he said, you know what? Here's how I use the noise in the stadium. The louder it gets, the slower I throw. And you think, you know, you think about that. Now, most people don't have the opportunity to be on the field. But if they're sitting in the stands, you're excited too, mm -hmm. right? Or even if you're home watching a game, football, basketball, baseball, whatever, you know. Right now, the, the NCAAs, you know, and they're going on, you know, it's like, you know, there's excitement with that, right? But you got to breathe. And you got to focus, right? Yeah. And the fundamentals, if you've done them enough and well and consistent, they'll come back to you. So what's the big word there? Trust. Mm -hmm. And understanding what the task is. Right? I have to do this? No, I don't have to do this. Right? But if I can focus on what I need to do one thing at a time and not look ahead... If it, the count's O and O, I need a strikeout. Well, I, I can't look for the third strike before I've thrown one pitch. What's the situation? Am I getting ahead in the count? Am I behind in the count? You know, I get another situation. One out, no outs, second and third. How do I minimize this inning? Right? Well, what do you do in golf? If you're a golfer, it's course management. Mm -hmm. When baseball, it's the same thing. All right, say there's nobody out, and I get the first guy to pop up. Okay, now I got one out, second and third. Okay, in baseball for me, as, as long as you can stay away from the crooked numbers, that's a two, a three, a four, you know, anything beyond, beyond number one. If you're in a duress situation, you've probably had a pretty good inning, right? And if you've scored previous to that, that makes that number stand up even more. But if you score one and they come back and score two, your one means nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to minimize the situation. So say that the next hitter comes up, I've got one out, second and third, and I fall behind in the count, who's on deck? I got a base open, right? So here comes that course management. Where's my success been with that guy? I, you know, this is all my pregame work. Is he swinging the bat well? What kind of, where am I in, in the game? You know, maybe if it's the sixth or seventh inning or the eighth inning, well, in today's game, if you're in the fifth inning, you're done. Yeah. But if you're in the sixth, seventh, eighth inning, you may not even get a chance to face that guy. But how can I put myself in the best situation here? If, I got a, if I've got a, a, a guy on deck and I'm falling behind in the count, I may nibble around the plate a little bit more. And if I get some action, okay, good. I get back into the count. If I don't, I'll, t I'll accept the walk because I know the next guy maybe is not as swift a foot. He hits more ground balls. He's an aggressive swinger early in the count. Um, and you've got the I'll force take, play. And I'll take my chances with a force play. Mm -hmm. Right? If I get the guy to pop up in the first two or three pitches, now i got two out, second, and third. 
now I've got to really, you know, boy, you've worked hard. It's not, oh, great, I got two outs, now I can relax. Yeah. No, now I got to bear down. Because mm-hmm. I could potentially put up a goose egg. Mm-hmm. And if I can put that goose egg up, boy, that's going to, that run that we previously scored is now going to stand big and allow us to maintain momentum. Mm-hmm. But if I give up a single down the right field line, two runs are going to score. Right. Right. So now it's back to pitch, one pitch at a time. How did I get to this situation? If I didn't have to walk somebody, now I still got a base open. I fall behind in the count. I don't like the situation. I can walk him and face the next guy. Mm-hmm. And then uh, ultimately, the manager's sitting in there going, okay, what do I want to do here? Right? We're going to put M- McGuire on base here. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, to me, that's kind of how you, you kind of self-manage things. Mm-hmm. But as a young player, I had no idea about any of that, right? I didn't understand that, mm-hmm. right, and couldn't comprehend that. And, again, I, I had probably a little bit bigger of an, oh, I can get this guy out, I'm gonna, you know, as I got older and a little, you know, had a little more maturity, is, you know, there was a big difference there. Yeah. Your first couple of years, you mentioned that, um, you know, as you lost some faith in, some faith in your fastball. Mm-hmm. I heard also, I heard a story that you wore something to oh, yeah. get you back yeah. into yeah. Yeah. early on. Yeah. Do you want to walk So uh, the movie Bull Durham, <laughs> right? Um, probably many people have seen that movie, but uh, it was it. Uh, Luke, 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 <laughs> Luke, Luke, I need to watch it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, for good luck, uh, he wore a garter belt. And uh, I was in Baltimore. I forget which year it was. And I had a buddy from home that uh, he would call me Meat. He still does. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he, you know, he, and, you know, he told it like, it tells it like it is. Oh, you're really struggling. You stink. And, you know, I'm like, yeah. Okay, so in the mail, he sent me a garter belt. And uh, I'm like, I'm going really bad right now. I'm going to try it. So, uh, the you know, for me, it was like, it was purple. And uh, it was like, I was a little embarrassed to, you know, I'm getting dressed in, in, a, in a locker room full of guys. I'm like, so I'd put it, roll it up, put it in my back pocket and go in the bathroom stalls and put it on. And I wore it. I won. I wore it again. I won. I wore it again. I pitched better. <laughs> Twenty years later, yeah, still I, no, I didn't wear it. No, I just I wore it for a short spell. Okay. But uh, yeah, so yeah, and he didn't believe me uh, that I did it. But I've talked about it publicly, and you know, I wouldn't lie about it. But, That's yeah. But I was a little embarrassed, you know. And I actually thought I could. You could see it through my uniform. <laughs> so uh, I guess with today's uniforms, you probably could. Now you definitely <laughs> can for sure. But yeah, you know when when. Uh, you know, you get what we used to call it stupid stitious. Um, you know, you fall into some of those, uh, into those things, right? But, you know, for me it worked, and, you know, it's like I would never uh, step on the foul line going yeah. on or off the field. Yeah. I, that was one that I just, you know, I didn't jump over it like Turk Wendell did. But, uh, uh, yeah, I would step over the line. Were there any big other superstitions that you saw teammates have that? Uh, food wise, I think guys, you know, had their their diet dietary things, and you know, diet wasn't early in my career. Diet wasn't you know on the top of the list. Uh, now I think diets become a really big thing mm-hmm. in baseball, and I think you know you look at guys on the field, and you know, there's some you know guys out there that are built quite well. Yeah. Um, look, you know, even when I first started playing the game, guys would come to spring training to get in shape. Now they come ready to go. Now they come in shape because it's gotten so much more competitive and you're under, I think you're under a bigger microscope. Mm -hmm. And when I say bigger microscope, yeah, you're being analyzed by your organization, but there's so many media outlets and there's so much social media. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. Right. Right. And everybody wants to be successful. And that's not going to happen. You know, everybody's going to have some sort of success. And look, if you're in a, a professional athlete, you've had a great deal of success somewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. But the other big thing in, in, prof- in for me in professional sports is, is 
and even, you know, college, high school, it's learning how to fail. Failure is a big part of baseball. I mean, baseball is all about failure, if you really think about it. Mm -hmm. If you look at numbers, if you're into numbers, baseball is a game of failure. So how do you deal with that? How do you handle that? How do you acknowledge that, right? Because you have to. Mm -hmm. And everybody basically, numbers-wise, is a failure. But what the numbers baseball accepts at, for success, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, you know, 333 is one heck of a batting average. You're for sure an all-star right? if you're succeeding. If you win out of 15 games out of, well, nobody starts 32, 33 games. Not many guys start 32, 33 games anymore. But if you win... 15 games out of 25 to 30 starts, that's considered a pretty darn good year. Mm -hmm. right? If you win 20, obviously that's you know a pinnacle for that season. Um, you know, I mean, it's just it is what it is. But we're talking about you know, if you look at any other profession, if you're successful 33 percent of the time, if your podcasts are 33 percent successful. You're, you're, you're not in business, right? right? If you're a doctor, a lawyer, you know, whatever it is, you're, you're not that guy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, learning to deal with the, the downside of things and, and, and also not taking it personal, you know, I think is, is really important as well. Mm -hmm. Now I think the, the league batting average is in the 240s. Well, look. That, that's the average. Strikeouts are accepted more so now than they ever were home runs there's probably more guys hitting 20 to 30 home runs now in today's game than there was 20 30 years ago you know 30 40 years ago there i don't even know that 30 or 35 home runs was you know as prevalent uh, but this, the style of play was different too, mm -hmm. right? They hit and ran. They bunted. There was there was a small little, ball. There's a little. Uh, the strategy was a lot different than today's strategy, mm -hmm. right? So there's those comparison contrast, you know, to the game. And again, is it right? Is it wrong? It's not for me to make that decision. It's what baseball wants right. and what the fans want, and you know, MLB's involved with that too. So. This is the product, and this is what we're giving you. Yeah. And how you know, and they're constantly looking. How can we make it better? And that's been, you know, I mean, baseballs. I think looked at that forever. How can we make it better? We want to give you a better product. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the product that you're getting right now. Um, how, how involved are you in the sport today, and watching, and being involved? I watch. Uh, I watch a lot of college baseball. College. I enjoy watching college baseball. Um, there's some awfully talented players in college, uh, but that's a different game than the pro game, right? Uh, they're not playing as many games, um, but you know, there's there's an awful lot of talent. There's a lot of good college baseball, and there's a lot of bad college baseball, <laughs> right? Um, but you know, there's a lot of good major league baseball, and there's some bad major league baseball too. So again, it's, again, it's a game of failure. Um, but no, I'm I'm not really you know I'm not really affiliated with any organizations. Um, in a respectful way, I think the game somehow or some not somehow in in a lot of light has passed me by. Um, as I was leaving the game, the saber metrics were coming into the game, yeah. And I didn't use that, and I felt like I was. It was in its infancy stages. And to me, I didn't, I'm like, you know what, I've already created who I am. Yeah. I didn't want to take that chance of trying to, and I didn't know how much longer I was going to play, but mm -hmm. trying to take that chance and, well, let me try that. And I, I'm not in a space to do that, right? And I've had somewhat of success doing it the way I'm doing it, so why change, right? If, mm -hmm. if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. That was kind of my mindset. If I were to play in the game today, yeah, I'd, I would obviously have to change. But with my style of pitching, I wouldn't even have, you know, I wouldn't even be looked at. You know, I, I wouldn't fit. However, 
I do believe a handful of guys like the Tom Glavins, you know, like myself, I think they'd have some, some semblance of success because they're not the norm. It's so different from what they're and typically And hitters seeing. hate off-speed. Yeah. Do you think it helped you at times being in a rotation with like a Randy Johnson? Oh, yeah. To where of yeah. he's coming out there yep. one day, next yep. day? Yeah. Completely different. Oh, I can world. remember Lou going, you know, I'm going to put you right behind Randy. Yeah. Now, you know, you know, a lot of times, you know, or with, with probably several teams, when Nolan would pitch, when Randy would pitch, uh, Dwight Gooden would pitch, you know, the harder throwers had in their eras, um, guys would get a day off. Regular would get a day off, right? And a bench guy would get a chance to play, right? So the only th the, the, my, from my perspective of it, all right, well, if he gets a chance to play against Randy, then he's going to play against me. He potentially gets a chance to play. Now he's good. So if I ask you to go hit golf balls once out of seven days out of the week, you'd be like, well, I'm, not a, I'm a little erratic. But if I ask you to hit balls two or three days in a row, you'd go, I'm starting to get it. Right. Right? Same thing with you know a bench guy. Mm -hmm. right? You give him consistent at-bats, he's going to start picking it up. So I had to be kind of aware of that, right? Even though we were two completely different types of pitchers, mm -hmm. right? It's still, you're giving a guy some semblance of confidence. Now, and a lot of guys would walk away with minimal or no confidence facing Randy. But then the next day, you know, they, all right, I'm ready to face this guy. Yeah. You know, there, I had guys that would tell me, you know what, the day you pitch, pregame, I'm going in the cage and I'm going to take, 200 swings i'm gonna get myself tired so i can <laughs> so i can face you be a little behind on a randy johnson yeah. fastball and then right. they're making contact yeah. with yours yeah yeah so a little you know little quirky things that guys would do that's funny yeah. um what what rotation throughout your career do you think was the best rotation that you were in <sighs> wow uh i had uh, the opportunity when i was in baltimore even though we didn't win Ben McDonald, Mike Mussina, Scott Erickson. I was in the back of that rotation. I'm trying to think of who the other, the fourth guy would have been. That was a fun rotation. Uh, the year here in Seattle, um, we had five starters make every start. Wow. Uh, it was uh, Freddie. Gilmesh, I believe Ryan Franklin, and Aaron Seely or Joel Pinero, and myself. I'm proud of that. That's, that you know that I was doing my job. We were doing our jobs, mm -hmm. right? You go out and that's what you're. That, that we had a role to play, and we played that role. Mm -hmm. And it was we tied a record that was set in I don't know like fifty or sixty years before us, right? That you know, that's kind of cool, right? That doesn't happen today, right? Um, but again, it, it was having pride in in you know all the preparation that we, we each did, and we were you know we were going to the post every fifth day, and uh, you know like you said, it, it we we're, we're the last ones to do it, and you know maybe it'll never be done, you know again. Were we doing that for a record? No, but we were doing it because it was our responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's how I looked at it. You know, for me, <clears throat> in the era that I played in, if you're a starting pitcher, put it this way, you're playing 162 games, times that by nine, comes out to like 1,500 and some odd innings, I believe. Mm -hmm. Don't hold me to that, but it's a lot of innings, right? So if you have five starters, and at that time, during my career, we had six or seven relievers. All right, you're asking 11 or 12 guys to pitch all those innings, mm -hmm. right? Now, your closer and your setup guy are really important at the end of the game. And your middle guys are really important, too, to get you to the closer, mm -hmm. right? Ask any manager that knows what they're doing and managing 
They want their starter to get to a certain point so they can now manage the game from their closer back, right? If my starter goes six, I got these two guys to get me through the seventh. I got my setup guy to pitch the eighth, and I got my closer to pitch, pitch the ninth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned a lot about that when, when Lou Pinella was our manager. He'd say, get me to the sixth. If you can get me seven or eight, that's great. But if you can get me to the sixth with my bullpen, I can get you, I can finish the game, and I feel confident about finishing that game. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't ask those guys to do that every day. Yeah, you're gonna have to have somebody go seven, eight, you know, or there's gonna be a blowout game, and your middle guy, your long man's gonna have to pick up four or five innings. Mm -hmm. But to me, getting back to my point, if you're gonna get make your 32, 33 starts to pitch 200 innings for five starters, that's the bulk of the innings. You wanna take the meaningless innings away from your bullpen as much as possible. Yeah, they're gonna get some meaningless innings, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing a lot, the meaning, meaningless innings are now going to position players. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Which I think is a joke. Yeah. Um, but it, that's one part I don't like. You're paying whatever you're paying to go to a game and you're seeing that and they're having fun and they're joking. I mean, that's not what the game's about. Right. Right? It's a serious game and you're trying to get people out. Because our, that's our livelihood, mm -hmm. right? But if you're asking, your, if you're getting a thousand innings out of your starters, a thousand plus innings, now my belief is your bullpen is going to pitch many more innings that have meaning. And now bullpens of what eight guys in them, I believe. In that range, it's it's yeah. you know you you know the way it's set up, they're right. you know it's a completely different setup, right? I and they're reducing roster spots, right? I think they're happy sometimes to have a starter to go three, um, which uh, it's kind of mind boggling. But I, they're training differently as well. They throw harder. I get it. There's just as many, if not more, injuries that I don't get. Um. That's the part I'm, I'm kind of like in a gray area with. I don't, the the I don't, injury part? Yeah. The, the, you know, you know, we got to make our starters last. We, all, we want them all to throw 95 to 100. I want my starters to be effective. Right. I don't care if he's throwing 60 or if he's throwing 110. And can he pitch five days later and five days later? I mean, early in my career, I go back to if you were the fifth guy in a rotation – and there was a rain out, you got bumped, and you'd be in the bullpen because they wanted their four horses mm -hmm. to stay on, on their routine. Yeah. So, again, difference in the game. You know, you, you're not going to do that in today's game. I, I totally get it. But I'm just saying, I'm making a comparison to the game. Um, but, yeah, back to, you know, if you're throwing a 1,000 innings, now you're asking your, your, your relief. And you know your closer is going to get what? What's a, what's a great year for saves for a closer? 30. 30, 35, 40. Yeah, in that range. You know, so that's not that many innings. He's probably going to pitch 50, 60, 70 innings over the course of, you know, the season. Mm -hmm. So now you're asking the rest of your bullpen to pick up the other innings. So if you can not tax them. And the other part of it, too, I think, and this is where managing, I think, becomes somewhat difficult, is you get a guy up or two guys up in the bullpen. You know, are you, you know, just having them toss? Or are you getting them heated up? Right. That's like an appearance. Mm -hmm. Right? So they were called dry humps when I played. So... You know, guys would come in after a game and, get, you know, like say you're struggling in the beginning of a game, they get a guy up in, the, in the, say, the second. And then you're struggling in the fourth, they get him up again. And you're struggling to get through the fifth and they get him up again and he doesn't get in. Or he's probably done for the day. Yeah. Now you're moving to your next guy. You're probably out of the game. Right? Yeah. So now that guy's been up three times. And he's heated up all three times. Mm -hmm. That's like that's more probably more than an appearance, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So he may be down the next day. So now you got to manage that. 
who's my starter the next day, who we playing the next day, you know, what, you know, I mean, that, that's re, that's, you know, you gotta be thinking that down the road. So it's an, you know, it, it's an entry, you know, and it's something that really isn't talked about, you know, I mean, they probably talk about it on some telecasts, but I mean, those are things, and you know, look, they don't have that kind of thing. Like you and I have sitting here talking, you know, during the game, there's a lot of things going on. Sometimes it's, the phone. Yeah. Sometimes it's harder to get into a, a big, deep conversation, like, or that conversation yeah. could go three or four innings, but um, yeah, that's a part of the game. How do you keep your your uh, your bench guys fresh? Are you getting? Are they just getting pinch hits or opportunities, pinch hitting opportunities? Or are you getting them in one or two days out of the week? When are you getting them in? You want them to have success. You don't want them to fail, 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 because you know all of a sudden they're going to start losing confidence. You know. So there's, I mean, there's just a lot of aspects to managing. Um, that you have to deal with. Yeah. And getting into your career, um, you know, going back to the first time that you were traded and also this kind of ties into what I'm seeing with the Mariners right now. They just brought back Mitch Hanniger. Mm -hmm. He has a history of, you know, keeping him on the field. Same thing with Mitch mm -hmm. Garber. Yep. These guys that are injury prone, but at the same time, there is a potential platoon of Luke Rayleigh, Dominic Canzone, right. these young guys. Luke Rayleigh has talked about how in the past, you know, he just wasn't given those consistent at bats right. up to up until last year. Right. Be careful what you wish for. Yes. <laughs> so it's, you know, how do you manage Mitch Hanniger? Do you let him play every day until he starts to feel it? Well, yeah. While I mean, also giving these guys at look, bats? He, I, I'm sure the Mariners are well aware of history and they're going to try to manage accordingly. Right. You know, if he plays, I mean, numbers are numbers, and they're crazy. You know what they can probably pull up with sabermetrics and mm -hmm. history and things like that. And then, what are the injuries? You know, is it a hamstring? Is it a back? Is it a ribs? Right. Ribs usually take a while to heal, right? Uh, is it a wrist? You know, is it a neck? You know, is it an ankle? I mean, all those things are important to whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. right? So for me, um, you know, they probably have some plan. But ask any manager or general manager. Yeah, we had a plan, right. but three weeks into the season, that blew up, so we had to go to plan B. Right. Right. So, I mean, the only thing you can do is try to prepare to the best of your ability with the information that you have. And then sometimes the players dictate that, you know, their health or their success or lack of success, you know, determines where that, how good that plan was, right? You either look like a genius. Or you look like, you know, oh, you know, he has no idea what he's doing as a manager or general. You know, you get you start getting the second guessers. And you're like, look, I can only plan off the information that I have. Right. right. So it's it's. It's almost one of those situations where you can't win right. unless the guy just has a career year. Yeah. Then you look like, you know, when, when you have a team or players that have career years, you look like a genius. Right. Mm hmm. But what happens when you have a team that has below career years, below average years? Mm -hmm. Now you look like a huge failure. Well, how do, how do you how do you know that? Right. You you can't determine that. I can't determine that. And you know, and a lot of times the players can't determine that. They're trying, right? And as long as they're trying, that's all you can ask for. You can only do so much, right? Yeah. Now you know, organ you know, been around players and organization go, oh, he's soft, he's this, he's that, he's, he's distracted. Okay, well, they have their, their own reasons for those opinions, um, but everybody's personality is different. Everybody's demeanor is different. Mm -hmm. Everybody's approach is a little different. So, and that's, to me, again, that's where the manager uh, is an important role, and the general manager is an important role. How do you piece that together? You know, Pat Gillick was really good at doing that uh, when I was with Seattle um, and when I was in Philadelphia. Uh, he was obviously really good at it in Toronto, you know, for a spell. Uh, you know, knowing your personnel, knowing what you're bringing in, knowing what you're, you're losing, mm -hmm. right? And then how do you piece that puzzle together, right? Yeah. That's important. You know, when we won in Seattle... You know, Ken Griffey Jr. unfortunately wasn't there. Randy Johnson unfortunately wasn't there. Alex Rodriguez unfortunately wasn't there. 
right? All great players. And I think, you know, they get tied to that. Well, they were part of making that. But, you know, they moved on for whatever reasons, traded, free agency, whatever it might be. And that's their choice, and that's great. But when we, when we won a lot of games, it was what personnel did they bring in? Right. You bring in a Mike Cameron who has a lot of personality. You bring in a John Olerud that's just, you know, a grinder. Mm -hmm. You bring in a Brett Boone that had a great career. Or, I mean, a, a great span. He had a great career, but, he, uh, you know, a, a great couple of years. Um, Here comes Ichiro. Then Ichiro comes in. Jay yeah. Buhner was there at one point. Edgar, I mean, uh, Danny Wilson, the list, you know, Danny Wilson was the backbone, you know, for the pitching staff. Mm -hmm. There was consistency there. Um, you know, look, we made, I'm trying to, Carlos Guillen, if Carlos I'm not mistaken, who came in with Freddie Garcia, right, in that trade. And, you know, he was going to be great, great, great. Well, if you remember, shortly after we got him, I believe it was in Oakland, he was rounding third base to, to score, blew out his knee. Man. You know, who knew that? Right. Right? He was a really good player. Mm -hmm. But who knew that was going to happen? You know, and Freak then he injuries. just, yeah. he never just really got back on his feet, mm -hmm. right? So we never really saw what that was going to bring. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, it, it's really hard. You know, I mean, you can only assess, you know, you, it's the eye test and then what your numbers are on the paper. Yeah. And then getting to know your personnel. Right. So in your career, the first time that you were traded, I'm curious from a player's standpoint, you know, it's probably... It's a tough one. Yeah. When you get traded the first time, it's tough. Um, you're thinking, geez, you, know, you don't want me. You know, what did I do? You know, but then again, on the other side, somebody else wants you. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm always going to try to look to the positive. Um, and I was able to do so. You know, I, I don't, I can't say that I had a great deal of success when I got traded to Texas. Uh, but it was part of my learning curve. Right? I didn't know that at that at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through my first injury, first time on the DL in Texas. Um, for the most part, I was quite proud of my career where I was able to stay off of the DL. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit older, uh, or a lot older. Uh, but you know, to me, making my my start every fifth day was the most important thing while I was in a uniform. How did it affect you moving from the rotation to the bullpen back to the rotation? Um, early in my career, like I said, I was that fifth guy. I got bounced to the to the bullpen, and you know, again with my crappy attitude, I looked at it as a demotion. But I was always told too that you're going to get back in the rotation when we see fit. Um, I pitched not a whole lot in Texas. I got bumped to the bullpen I did I didn't enjoy that that was hard um and you know we weren't a real good team but again I also look at it I have to look at myself in the mirror mm -hmm. you're not contributing enough so you've got to figure that out I can't be mad at the manager I can't be mad at the general manager mm -hmm. I mean if I can I learned that that's wasted energy why, why would I put that energy into that? I mean, at, the t at that time, I probably did. But what I learned is why, put it, why would I put my energy into that? Something that I can't control, what can I control? Well, I can control my mind, and I can control what I do and my preparation. Um, and I need to be more consistent out on the field. Make their decisions difficult. That's what I would tell a young player. Don't worry about the decisions, but there are always going to be decisions being made. Make their decisions difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I told young kids, have you ever asked, you know, you always ask the coach, why am I not playing? Have you ever asked the coach, why am I playing? No. Nope. Just, oh, well, I deserve it. That's I expect to be here, right? right? But why am I playing? Why? What do you see in me? I used to tell my kids, my boys this all the time. Ask your coach why you're playing. What do you see in me over somebody else? Right? It's, it's good to hear the things you do well. But it's also good to hear the things that you don't do well. And it's just an opinion. You may not agree with it. 
So if you're going to ask somebody for their, for their opinion, be prepared to hear something you don't want to hear. Right. But don't take it as a criticism. Take it as a positive criticism. And then take what they say, whether you agree or disagree, and become better. Mm -hmm. But I think we take criticism always as a negative, and our guard goes up. And take up. it personally. You're exactly. Like they're attacking me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think the perspective that you have on it, you know, if you're asking, you better be prepared to hear the answer. Mm -hmm. Especially as a professional. You're an adult. Right? And you're in you're in a, in a field that they expect perfection, mm -hmm. and your window to do it may be this big, or it might be this big, or it might be that big. You don't know that, but you can help create that. Mm -hmm. And we've yeah. talked, I mean, in a lot of different directions thus far on how you can do that. I think. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's get into your time in Seattle. Okay. I want to hear, hear that experience. Mm -hmm. When you were first, uh, you were traded over there from mm -hmm. the Red Sox. Yep. And so walk me through that initial trade. At the time, they were in the Kingdom. I'm also yep. curious. You started the game, the inaugural game at Safeco mm -hmm. Field. Yep. So uh, I'm sure you know how much of a pitcher-friendly ballpark, T-Mobile Park, Safeco is now in Seattle with – at least it's known in the big pitcher leagues. Pitcher friendly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't call it pitcher friendly. That's. Th I th think when we first moved in there, it was. Okay. The ball, I think, you know, people talk about, and again, this is way over my head, but uh, barometric pressure and the cement. They call it the marine layer. Yeah. It's where this, yeah. the yeah. sea air comes I, yeah, in. Yeah, sometimes it, then yeah. the ball doesn't carry as right. well. But I also believe, too that when it's warm there, the ball jumps out of that ballpark. Okay. I really do. But I, I, you know, so when we, well, let me, let me, let's, let's go back. To the trade. That'll be, yeah. yeah. The part two is, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, when I got traded, I was actually really excited. Um, in Boston, you know, when I signed with Boston, that off season, they said, look, you know, we don't know what you're going to do for us. And I ended up being the sixth man in a five-man rotation and the seventh man in a six-man bullpen. <laughs> I didn't realize. I was kind of floating. Yeah. Right? I got a couple spot starts, uh, but I was basically the long man in the bullpen. And I wanted to start because that's what I did mm -hmm. basically my whole career. And um, you know, we had Roger Clements on that staff. So what I did... Because I, you know, I prepared to start in spring training, and I actually started. We, if, if you go back and look at that season, we started that season zero and four. I believe I started the fifth game, and we we won our first game when there I you started. Go. You know, so I'm like, hey. and then I went right back to the bullpen, right? So yeah, that that it just wasn't. You know, they were trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. So, I took it upon myself. When the day that Roger Clemens started, he was going to throw 150 pitches. Jeez. It didn't matter. Yeah. He was throwing 150 pitches. That's the kind of warrior he was, right? So I'm like, okay, well, if he's going to throw 150 pitches, he's not going to throw those in the first five innings probably. So I'm going to use that as my bullpen day, as if I was a starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. So I'd throw a long bullpen that day. And kept my fingers crossed that I didn't get in that game. And uh, so let's move now to the trading deadline. I get traded to Seattle, and I walk in the door, and the club's in Milwaukee. And basically Lou says, here's the ball. You're going to start. Now, I've seen a lot of times where a guy – might be a bullpen guy and get traded and become a starter. And he goes, well, I'm not ready. I need mm -hmm. a week or two weeks to, you know, get my, and I was like, thank you. I took the ball and I started for the rest of the season. I had a fairly decent, you know, rest of the season and uh, impressed them enough to, you know, to have an opportunity to be a starter the next year. And I feel like I took the ball and ran with it. But, uh, you know, 
somebody to show that kind of confidence in me was what I needed uh, on that side of things, knowing that I needed to do the bulk of the work on my side mm -hmm. because now I had, again, another opportunity. Like yeah. I told you, I, you know, I got a lot of opportunities in my career. So, you know, I was old enough to understand that, hey, this might be your last opportunity. So I, t I took it as that and I looked, looked upon it as that and that's exactly what I did. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, when I came to Seattle, things were starting to move forward. Yeah. So that was something I hadn't really ever experienced in my career at that point either. Mm -hmm. So it was exciting times. Um, I love pitching in the kingdom. People hated the kingdom. The only thing I didn't like about being in the kingdom was that on the beautiful sunny days, you know, you were in there all day long yeah. and didn't get to enjoy the wonderful weather. Other than that, I love the kingdom. Uh, but, you know, and I didn't mind it coming in as an opponent. And I came in as an opponent, and I felt like I had a, a, a decent amount of success. Um, so when I came to Seattle, you know, it was not an issue for me. Would you call the kingdom hitter-friendly, pitcher-friendly? Oh, in, definitely hitter-friendly. Hitter-friendly? Definitely, especially right field. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the turf. Right. So the field was a lot quicker. The balls are flying right? off yeah. the turf. yeah. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed pitching in Seattle, enjoyed pitching in the Kingdom. And then, yeah, I, had, I was fortunate enough to be handed the ball to pitch the first game uh, in what was then Safeco Field. Um, we lost that game 3-2, to two, but uh, it was against the Padres. It was a good game. Uh, I think Jose, and unfortunately, the end of the game, Jose Mesa blew that lead. Um, but it was a, a very memorable day, uh, and I was honored to have that, that opportunity to, to be that guy. Um, but yeah, you know, moving forward then, you know, I, I you know, and again, I, I only know this from using my ears. The hitters used to complain, you know, the ball doesn't carry here. You know, now look, you're going from across the street in the kingdom, <laughs> right, to now you're playing outdoors, you've got weather, right. you know, the fog, you know, mm -hmm. the dampness, the coolness, um, you know, and then people went even as far as saying, you know, the cement was dry, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, they said just the air was heavy mm -hmm. and the ball didn't carry. Now, when they closed the roof, I think the ball carried better. Even though it's an open air mm -hmm. roof. Yeah. Interesting. So, and the, uh, there were times where there was some wind in there as well because it was open. But, you know, wonderful ballpark. Mm -hmm. Wonderful Beautiful. ballpark. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a you know, there was a time where there was a struggle with the, the backdrop when we first moved in, the hitter's eye. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a glare at certain times of the year, certain times of the day. There was a glare for not only the hitters, it was the catcher and the umpire. Oh man, yeah. As well. So it took them, you know, they did several they several attempts till they were able to figure out what to do with that. Um, but you know, wonderful ballpark. Um Great city to play in, great fans. You know, I had nothing but positive things to say of my time in Seattle. 1997, you get to the playoffs for the first time, mm -hmm. and you make your first appearance. Walk me through the 97 season. And uh, well, I mean, again, it's when you win, it's magical. It really is. You know, I mean, it's your group with the coaching staff and the organization, but – you know, the city backed us, the fan base backed us, and that, you know, I'll go to my grave saying that, you know, it's when you got a ballpark full of people um, screaming and hollering for you, it's uplifting. Mm -hmm. It's uplifting. And I was fortunate enough to go to the, the hockey game January 1st this year. Okay. To see us, so, yeah, to watch the Kraken play. Okay. And it brought back so many memories of 97, 98, you know, that that era of baseball with the Mariners, sold out stadium, noise, music, excitement, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'm just kind of sitting there, wow, this, unfortunately, this stadium hasn't seen a lot of that. You know, I mean, the last couple of years, the Mariners have mm -hmm. done a lot better, um, but, you know, to get into that playoff situation and, 
you know, that's what it's about. And, uh, you know, 97, I mean, was phenomenal. You know, unfortunately, you know, when we got to the playoffs, we just seemed to fall short. You know, it was either we were a pitcher short, we were a hitter short, you know, in some fashion. And, and again, that comes back to that juggling act as, as a general manager and as an organization. Who do we add? How do we add? Because sometimes you have to look at these types of situations and, and kind of understand those situations and say, okay, if we add, what are we bringing in? Is it going to detract from the situation? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to make the situation better? And you don't, you really don't know. So again, and how do you know about the player or players you're bringing in, right? Are they in contract years? Are they playing banged up? Are they healthy? You know, I mean, there's a lot of factors. Or are they going to become a free agent? And if they're going to, will they fit into our, our salary structure? Are we going to rent a player? Mm -hmm. What are we giving away to get that player? Right. right. There's a lot of variables that come into play. Yeah. Right. And again, as a you know, and look, I, if you're a manager or general manager and you're making those decisions, I don't think you you can really. Per, you don't have a crystal ball to predict, and you can't worry about what people are going to think. If you're trying to do your best and you've got the graces of the ownership and you're adding, you think you're adding something to your club, then, you know, I think you do it, mm -hmm. right? But you also sometimes, like I was starting to say, sometimes if you add, it detracts from the team based on the clubhouse. The, Exactly. Yeah. And that can be, you know, you know, a huge knife in the coffin. Mm -hmm. So now it becomes, you know, you, you're kind of on a roll. How's that going to work? Right. And sometimes your best trade is no trade. Mm -hmm. Right. But then when you, if you can fortunate enough to move on and you fall short, you go, oh, well, we should have, you know, they should have done the, you know, it's easy to second guess. Right. Right. And I'm not here to second guess anybody. You know, they were doing what they thought they should do. Um, but it was fun being a part of it, and it was that to me. The, those are the memories that are created. I mean, I, I mean, being in town, living. You know, I live not far out of town, so that that feeling, that vibe, that uplifting. Anywhere you went, you know, everybody was kind of walking on air. It was mm -hmm. the same way in Philadelphia when we won a World Series. It was. Everybody had the colors on. The radio talk shows were nothing but positive. And mm -hmm. it was just, and people were excited to come to the ballpark. And to me, that was the cool part. That 116 win season in 2001, yeah. st record still stands. Yeah. What was um, it like to come to the ballpark every day in that it environment? Was, it was, the feeling was we're not going to lose. Yeah. And not in a cocky way, not in a brash way. We didn't know it. I mean, my recall of spring training was we had a very mediocre spring training. And towards the end of spring training, I, if I recall, we were, I was on a trip to uh, Tucson, and we were playing horribly. And I can remember Lou pacing up and down the dugout. Now, this is spring training. <laughs> and, you know, using language that, you know, I can't use here. Um, but just like, you know, you can't turn it off. You can't, you know, just turn it off and turn it on. You know, we the season's a couple of days away, blah, 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 you know. And then the season starts. Win, 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 lose, win, 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 win. You know, and, you know, in the beginning of the year, I've been, you know, there was one year when I was in Texas. I'm gonna say it might have been my second year in Texas. We were like 11 and one or 12 and three, you know, thinking, "Huh, this is a joke." You know, we're gonna, you know, it's not hot yet. You know, a lot of things down there come into play. You know, so it's like, okay, let's let's be respectful of this, right? The baseball mm -hmm. gods. You hear people talk about the baseball gods. You know, <laughs> they're gonna get you, and you know, things even out. Oh, well, you know, we get through April and we're winning. Right, get into May, we're winning, and 
It didn't matter. If we were down in a game, whether it was three, whether it was one, down to one out, or in the sixth inning, whatever it was, if we whatever we needed, we went out and manufactured. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like, respectfully, you're kind of giggly. <laughs> like it's like that, it's gonna happen. Did at that some point. did that just happen? Yeah. Did we just come back? Like I feel like there was a game in in uh, I don't know if it was 01 or not, but we had a game in Minneapolis where we were losing big. I believe we hit seven doubles in a row. Wow. <laughs> like the stuff doesn't happen, mm-hmm. right? And I mean. And you know, I look back at that season, and I th- this is going to sound negative, but I don't look at it as a negative. We averaged. To me, it's my crazy left-handed way of looking at things. We averaged seven losses a month. That season, we all know the big number one sixteen, mm-hmm. right? Seven losses a month. That's, that's it's unheard of, mm-hmm. right? And the the great thing was, every player that had a uniform on that season made a large contribution, and that's what allowed us to do what we did. How are the uh, clubhouse vibes? Was everyone just buddy buddy that entire year to where everyone's having um, a good time? And yeah, you know what? And you know what? Rolling. Whether we won or we didn't lose, I don't know that. You know, when you say buddy, buddy, I think most of the clubhouses I've been in, people have gotten along. Mm -hmm. But in a clubhouse like that, when you're winning, there's a bounce in people's step when they come in the door. And I've explained it like this in the past where we had a lot of, I'm going to say we had a lot of blue collar players. Mm -hmm. And they'd open the clubhouse door. And even though there wasn't a time clock, and, a, and a, a rack of hard hats. But that's kind of how I envision it. Mm-hmm. You took your time card out, you clocked in, you put it back, you went over to your hard hat, you put your hard hat on, and you went to work. Mm-hmm. And that's what guys did. And it was day after day after day after day. And, but again, it comes down to the personality. Mm-hmm. And then... Okay, we won yesterday, so we got to go out and win again today. You get that taste in your mouth, mm-hmm. and it's a good taste. So you're like, okay, we're getting it. This is how. This is how. And and we just built off of it. And uh, yeah, it was, it was magical. And like I said, if we were down in a game, it didn't matter what part of the game, especially late in the game, we need three. We'll get. Let's get four. Oh, let's. <laughs> you know what? Let's get one more. Let's get five. You know, and it, like you say, it wasn't in a cocky way. It wasn't in a brash way. You know, and guys are like, do you believe what's happening? Is this really happening? You know, like, pinch me. Is this really happening? <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, it was magical. And, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get deep into the playoffs that year. Mm-hmm. But here again, it comes back down to, I'm not putting it on loose shoulders, but you play so well. I forget when it was we clinched, but I want to say – it was end of August, beginning of September. Okay, now you got another month to play. Right. Right? It was almost like it hurt us to be that successful. Because now, as a manager, what do you do? Because now, you know, common sense tells you, okay, well, I should keep playing my players. Mm -hmm. But what if he gets hurt? What if he gets tired? So now as a manager, you go, all right, I'm going to let this guy play, but I'm going to give him a, a more days off, mm-hmm. right? I, I want to rest him so we're ready to go in the playoffs, right? Right. So you, we, I, I feel like looking back, not necessarily being involved in the situation, I would not tell you in that moment that we lost our edge. But looking back on it, we may have lost our edge a little bit. Making a big change like right. that. Right. 
Well, it wasn't necessarily a change, yeah. but I mean, you're just, you know, People guys that play every day. They got out of their groove, maybe a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't say they got complacent. I don't, I, there's no way there was complacency going on. There's a ton of excitement. But, you know, you know, I look at things this way. Um, the year that when I was in, in 07, when I told you that the Rockies cut right through us, they swept us. If you recall, I forget who they played in the next round. They walked right over them, too. Right? So now they're going to the World Series. Mm -hmm. Who did they play? Boston. Well, Boston was in maybe it was uh, Boston, New York. If I'm not mistaken, I don't remember exactly. Either way, okay, yeah. Boston had to keep playing and grind through that next round and then jump right into the World Series. They didn't have time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Colorado, oh, we cut right through the Phillies. They're a pretty good team. Take a day off. We cut through the next, you know, they yeah. cut right through the next team. Now, they, I want to say they had four or five days okay. to stay sharp. Right, you see it with college football, in in yeah, like know, the national championship. Right, yeah. you see it uh, in the NFL. Right, that time. Well, look, when your body is used to doing something day after day after day, and now you, it changes. Like for me, I hated the All Star break. In the era that I played in, it was mostly three days. Towards the end of when I was playing, it became four days. Hated it because you can't replace what you've been doing every day if you go home. Even if you stay in the city you're playing in and try to work out, you're still not playing a game. Mm -hmm. So you kind of lose that that edge. And then you get back from the break, and it takes a couple days to kind of get, you know, you can't just, again, flip the switch. Right. So I think that's kind of what happened to us. We got a little flat. And, you know, I, like what we did during that regular season was magical. But for us, for that 116 to really stand up, we would have needed to win the World Series. Then I think that 116 gets talked about a little bit more. And that team as a whole gets talked about a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not all about what you do in the regular season. It's, right. it's about right. what you do well, in the postseason. Yeah, what, is, what have you done for me lately? Right. right? <laughs> yeah. What was it like playing for Lou? Loved it. We see. My most favorite manager yeah. ever. He would be first. Charlie Manuel would be second. And they're really close. Um, but two different personalities, two different types of people, but both wonderful baseball people. Lou was passionate about winning. Um, I describe Lou as having another teammate on the team. He cared about winning, and he cared about you as a player. Every one of his players. Now, he was hard on you. Mm -hmm. If you weren't pulling your end, he could be, especially with your pitcher, he could be really hard on you. But it wasn't because he didn't like you or he disliked you. It's because you weren't doing your job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of kind of look at that, you know, I look at his history, where he came from, and where he played and coached, and that was with the Yankees. And... You know, they, there was an expectation, especially when Mr. Steinbrenner was running that show, mm -hmm. right? And as a player and as a coach, we've seen, you know, the, the stuff, the run-ins that he's had with, you know, with players, with, with managers. Um, and I think Lou kind of, that kind of cr helped create Lou to, to who he was as a manager. Mm -hmm. And he brought that. To our organization, he was passionate, passionate, but respectful. And the cool thing, I, one of the cool things I enjoyed with him was that, um, well, there's two. One, approachable, always approachable. Um, whether it was in his office, on the bench, wherever it might be. But there's a guy, if you talk to him and you were asking about yourself be prepared because you may hear something you don't want to hear, right? <laughs> but the other cool thing was he was bilingual. Really? Yeah. So he would ob he would habla with the Latin guys wow. fluently, which I thought was really cool. I think that's uh, it's a special uh, trait that some people have. 
And uh, I, you know, when you have uh, Latins on a team, you know, I, I, I put it this way, if I ever had to go to Japan and play or a Latin American country to play and don't know the language, and nobody speaks my language, it's really hard. That's another threshold that you have to get over. Mm -hmm. Now when the manager can talk to you, I think it, it's really, it, it's it, massive. It, 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 it brings a certain kind of calmness or a comfort, it allows a comfortability, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I've played with a, a fair amount of Latin players that preferred, could speak some broken English, but preferred to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So to have that rapport with your manager, I think was, was very cool. And like you said, thirdly, again, he was passionate. Mm -hmm. passionate maybe that should go first very passionate about winning he cared he cared but he, he cared about his players too was it one of those things to where he might blow up in the moment but then after the game he talks yeah. to you again yeah. and is like hey well a lot of times it wasn't necessary i mean sometimes it was after the game but it might be the next day it might be two days later mm -hmm. it may be during batting practice um you know it wasn't like you're getting called into the principal's office. Yeah. I mean, that, I don't know that that, unless there was something major going on, I never had that, but I was comfortable enough when necessary, and I did it on two different occasions where I went to him, went in his office and asked him to talk, and you know, the feedback that I got was wonderful. And I didn't take it personal, because I had some of those, ex like I said, I had some of those experiences previously in my career and some of them I took personally but I learned how to deal with it and I learned that he wasn't he wasn't coming after me he was giving his opinion and his opinion was spot on even though he never pitched an inning in his life <laughs> so I was getting it from a hitter's perspective okay and that's how I took it and it was it was wonderful and it I was struggling at the time one of them was in Candlestick Park uh, where I went into his office and had a conversation with him. And he's, he looked at me and he said, you're not throwing your changeup enough. And my changeup wasn't good at that point in time. And it just so happened that uh, that day I threw a bullpen. And I probably threw 60 or 70 changeups in that bullpen and continued to work on it. And my next start, it all came back. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I yeah, I, and it, it, last summer I happened to bump into him at the All Star Game. It was great to see him. I hadn't seen him in many years. So um, yeah, we had a lot of a lot of fun conversation. And then on top of that, it sounds like Lou was giving you some pitching advice. I assume that you had pitching coaches throughout yep. your career. Yep. That would. Would, would they give you the, the advice to the pitch usage, the percentages? Uh, no, 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 certain? no, 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 that wasn't that percentages wasn't and stuff like that. Pitch usage, maybe. Um, for me, a lot of it was with my pitching coaches, it was mechanical, uh, mechanical things, because I was a very mechanical kind of guy. I was very visual. I needed to see it, uh, or I needed to see hitters' reactions to it. As a young player, I didn't understand that. As an older player, it, it kind of clicked for me. Um, but, you know, my very first pitching coach, his name was Bill Ballou. I was a short season A ball team. He was a college, some, uh, college coach, pitching coach, and he did it as a summer job. I mean, he helped me as much as some of my major league pitching coaches. You know, mm -hmm. right place at the right time kind of thing. Um, but it's that rapport that you build, that respect, that give and take kind of respect that you have for those people and the time and the effort that they put in and the caring that they that they have for you and your pitching staff um uh boy i can't think of his name um dick bosman mike flanagan when i in baltimore um were very beneficial to me um brian price in seattle dick pole uh who i i'm still friends with um Dick Pohl uh, pitched for Seattle, actually the Pilots, I believe. Uh, but I had him as a minor league pitching coach with the Cubs. Uh, had him for a short bit as a big league pitching coach with the Cubs. 
Um, he went on and he became one of, du he's one of Dusty's best friends. So he was a pitching coach for Dusty for many, many years. Uh, he, he was a pitching coach in Cleveland as well. Uh, got along really well with the, another guy told it like it was black was black, white was white. It was, you know, it was right in front of you, but you know, he, he, you know, he'd get in my grill when I when, but I understood why. And, uh, and it was never really motivational. It was just about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Dick was hard. You know, even <laughs> if you, you know, in the minor leagues, you kept the pitching chart bef the night before you pitched. And he either had a clicker or he'd count in his head the pitches. And, you know, like the third inning, you say, hey, Moye, how many pitches you got? <laughs> I got 37. You're off by two. It's 39. Fix it. You know, I mean, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, or if you came back at the end of the game and you had to total everything up, and your totals didn't, he wouldn't. He wouldn't accept the chart. Go back and figure it out. So I mean, things like that, little discipline things. You're mm -hmm. not paying attention. You missed a pitch here, that kind of stuff. Or you're throwing a bullpen. You say, hey, the other day, why did you throw that curveball? You remember that? <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it gets you thinking. Yeah. I, I, hey, I'm, I, I need to pay more attention here. I need to be a little more astute to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So um, Stan Williams, uh, we had him for a short bit in, in Seattle. Older, older gentleman. Um, came from a different era. But uh, I enjoyed him for the short time we had him. Uh, Nardi Contreras, Bobby Cuellar was the first pitching coach I had in Seattle. Um, you know, he got... At times he got a bum rap from from Lou, uh, but Lou had to take it out on somebody when we weren't throwing enough <laughs> strikes or pitching well or consistently. Um, you know he'd get on our bullpen guys, um, and Bobby Cuellar, you know he he took it. Uh, Nardi Contreras was another guy, uh, different style of pitching coach, but you know he was Brian Price. You had never had any major league experience, became the pitching coach in Seattle and. He's now the, still the, he's a pitching coach in um, San Francisco right now. Um, he went on to manage. He worked with the Phillies. Um, I still keep in touch with Brian. Um, uh, Rich Doobie in Philadelphia, uh, another guy that you know had a lot of you know, great experiences with, and a lot of fun with too. I mean, it's it's not all just work. Mm -hmm. It's it's some fun stuff too. Yeah. So yeah, it's just and you know. You look back and it's like, wow, these guys are really played really important roles uh, to their job and in, in, in my career. Mm -hmm. How did certain hitters help you shape your repertoire? Like, if you were to be pitching into a teammate, they were seeing certain things. Well, it was interesting. That's a, a really interesting and great question. Um, when I played in Baltimore, Brady Anderson was, you know, on the uprise in his career, and he played center field sometimes or he played left field and uh he'd pull me aside you know and i was struggling at times with left-handed hitters and he pulled me aside and he'd start asking me questions and he was giving me his perspective mm -hmm. on pitching and he wasn't telling me how to pitch but he would like yeah maybe you should you know so that was interesting cal ripkin would help our catcher at times call pitches he had a little sign to Cal, and Cal would call, help him, you know, call pitches. Um, <clears throat> I had a game. It was an inter, early in the interleague play where St. Louis came into town, and uh, I pitched against them and uh, actually had a really good game against them. And I had just come off of a, 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 a time where I had been struggling but had a really good game. And I'm so, you know, confidence-wise, I was kind of on the fence – and came walking off the field. And the Cardinals were coming on the field. As I got to the first base line, Tino Martinez was walking down the first base line. And I I know who he is. I don't know him overly well. I know him to say hello. Hey, Tino, how you doing? Hey, Jamie. He goes, wow, you had a heck of a game last night. I looked at him and I said, why do you say that? He goes, everything you threw had downward angle to it. And when you faced me, it had downward angle, and it went away from me. And he said, you pitched in. And I was like, wow. 
thank you for that. So you know what I did? I went into our video room, and we were still at that time using VHS tapes. I'm yeah. dating myself, <laughs> but we were using VHS tapes. And I asked our video guy, I said, can you make me a copy of that game? And I had, I kept it in my locker. So when I started to struggle, I'd go back and I'd go back just like I did with this conversation right here about what he said. And I'd start, and I'm like, how did I get to that? How was I doing that? How was I doing that? Mm -hmm. So I would, if I had to go back and look at that tape, I'd turn the volume off because I didn't care about what people were saying. Yeah. I was looking at shapes of pitches and looking at hitter swings, how they were reacting to what I was throwing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like my little, other than my mental, my uh, Harvey's book, um, that was my my video that I would go to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. And then walk me through your general approach to a righty versus your general approach to a lefty and how you mm. would pitch differently to them or your okay. sequencing okay. sequencing to righties. Oh, I'm going to tell you this. Probably looking back early in my career, I thought I had an approach and it probably wasn't a good approach. But as I gained experience um, and, and confidence, uh, you know, look, I was a you know, below average velocity pitcher, well below average velocity pitcher. I had to focus on down and angle. Um, so to me, and my honey hole was down and away. But to both. If I, n yeah, down yep. and away to righties, yep. uh, down and away to lefties. Yep. However, I needed to keep you honest in. Mm -hmm. Now, was that at the belt or was it? in the thigh to the knees or below the zone to move your feet. Because if I hit you, if I hit you in the right spot, it might hurt. <laughs> but in most cases, it didn't, right? And it really wasn't advantageous for me to throw at people anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's that cat and mouse game of in and out, but also with being an off-speed type of pitcher, it was forward and back. Okay. So it was that combination of, it was that chess game, mm -hmm. right? Um, and understanding how I got ahead, if I got ahead, how I got behind, if I got behind, was I nibbling too much early in the count? Um, and then taking that and understanding, and you know, sometimes I've, I learned, for me especially, if I was a, you know, well, again, I didn't throw hard. But if I got you out in early, that might be the last time I need to throw you any strikes in for the rest of the game. Because then they're always thinking right there. Because they're now going to start to protect that, so now mm -hmm. this opens up. Yep. Or if I go down and away, you get a base hit. If I go down and away, you get a base hit. Now, now all of a sudden, I got you're out there, and you're out there with me. Now, how do I get you off that? Mm-hmm. I got to come back in here. I got to establish a strike in here or a couple of strikes in here. You know, and the thing at the major league level, these guys aren't stupid. They have a video guy mm -hmm. and they're sitting on the bench. I would, I'm assuming, trying to give them too much credit, but I'm assuming they're, you know, he hasn't thrown a strike in. So why am I going to look in if he hasn't thrown a strike in? Right? Mm -hmm. So now I can cut the plate in half. And now it's either a fit. So now I'm going to sit fastball or change up. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, I went through a spell in my career where I, I felt like I struggled against left-handed hitters because I didn't throw enough fastballs in and I didn't show enough strikes in. So they were just waiting for that outer, outer third? Yeah, the cutter away, Slider. change up away, fastball away, and they start leaning out over the plate. So... I really worked on pitching in and <clears throat> made it a priority and pitched left-handers as I went, got to the latter part of my career, or the, you know, the last maybe 10 years of my career, I felt like I pitched in the lefties a lot more than I did early in my career. And now things started to level out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it got to a point where, it got, became very frustrating because when I would face Carlos Delgado, who hit me pretty well, um, golly, 
that guy, I could go strike one, strike two, but I couldn't get the third one by him. Really? And gave up some several home runs to him, some balls he hit quite well. And I'm like, he shouldn't be doing that. Well, it's because I didn't establish in enough. I didn't show him that he just can't look away. And I think that made a difference for me. And I got to a point where, um, you know, look, when you retire, you know, all the, you know, and you're around, especially around hitters, you know, you start talking, you're at the golf course or whatever, start talking. I ran into David Justice once, and he's like, you know what, you were one of the toughest lefties I had to face. And I kind of looked at him and I said, why do you say that, David? He goes, you're one of the few left-handers that pitched me in. Now, I faced him in Cleveland. And I faced him in New York. Now, Cleveland's a little more of a fair ballpark. New York has the short porch in right field. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that ball to get out, the ball away, get out and hook it, it's easier to do with a short porch. Mm -hmm. So keeping him honest in, keeping him, and then moving him off the plate. Uh, and that's where I, I feel like I got to the point where I didn't care anymore. I think at first it was like, I don't want to hit him. I got to the point now I was like, I'm coming in there. And if I hit you, it's your fault because you didn't get out of the way. <laughs> Were those sinkers in or cutters? Two seamers. Or I would throw two seamers in. I didn't okay. want, again, I didn't want that ball to be straight. Right. Yeah. And it, for me, I couldn't elevate and have success. If I elevated, it had to be at your eyes or like your neck and your shoulders and yeah. above just to show you the ball up there. But most guys aren't going to swing at that. But if I brought it to your sternum, it's gone. <laughs> they can hit it. Yeah. Right. And now you see a lot of, you know, now again, you're talking higher velocity, 95 and 100 up, where that ball stays on plane and it's got a good spin rate. Um, you know, guys even hit that at times. Right. right? So, yeah, I, I couldn't get away with the bigger part of this. Once in a while, maybe up and away, but I couldn't stay there. So for me, it was down. It was changing speeds and making every pitch look the same out of my hand. Mm -hmm. Really using that tunneling. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, tunneling. I never heard of that word till the last 10 years, right? Yeah. So I almost look at it, and I think I read a book once where Steve Carlton talked about it was like a rain gutter. He saw the ball go down like a rain gutter. Hmm. Now, you know, I can't, I'll never compare myself to Steve Carlton. I mean, he was a, fastball slider pitcher and he had one hell of a slider you know and I mean he was dominant who would you say um you know with the the game transitioning to the higher velocity you know um yeah higher spin rate movement all that stuff who would you say current day pitches similar to how you pitched if there's nobody any? no <laughs> one <laughs> nobody um I mean even I mean Clayton's been hurt Kershaw's been hurt yep. a lot recently, uh, but I, I, I can't even. I, I I'd be a knucklehead <laughs> to try to compare myself to Clayton Kershaw. There's, I mean, I mean, he came into the game at I want to say ninety two, ninety four when he first came into the game. I don't know if he sits there. I mean, he probably could get that now, yeah. but he probably can't sit there anymore. Ninety, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. There's nobody in the game that I'm aware of that, you know, throws the slop that I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then at the end of your career, you were considering coming back as a knuckleball pitcher. I don't know where that came from. Oh, that's uh, not true? Uh, my college coach, George Bennett, he, he was trying to convince me to do that. And I'm like, nah, I can't do that. And I, I mean, that's a tough pitch to throw. Yeah. That's a, I think it's a tough pitch to throw. Yeah. Who are your uh, top three toughest hitters to face Mike Schmidt I'm gonna throw in there Mark Kotze for some lefty okay. lefty gave me fits <laughs> um, and he knows it we would go back and forth um, you know it's interesting uh, early in his career I felt uh, when he was with the Giants in Kansas City, I kind of had my, I don't want to say I had my, I never really had my way with anybody, but I had success against Chili Davis. And then when he went to Anaheim and got some ex more experience and maturity and 
he became a very difficult hitter for me. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero, he had no strike zone. I mean, he could hit the ball from his shoe tops to his he eyes. Was, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, guys like that um, were, were difficult. I'm sure there's guys that have some real um, – uh, Barry Bonds for a while. Um, when I was in those earlier years, uh, when I was in St. Louis, he crushed me. Um, but again, I didn't pitch in, and I started to pitch in. And again, I didn't. I wouldn't say I have. I don't know. I'm. You know, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe I have 30, 40 at bats against Barry Bonds, but I'll bet he's hit five to seven home runs off me. He was, I'll tell you what, obviously everybody knows that he had a lot of home runs. But early in his career when he was in Pittsburgh and he had choked up a little bit on that bat, he could drive the ball the other way. He had power. He had foot speed. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, as a hitter, he was a great hitter. And he just whipped the bat through the zone. Um, didn't face him a whole lot. Um, Eric Davis, bat speed, almost scary, <laughs> coming through the zone. It was like a blur. Um, McGuire, do you remember? Yeah, I, 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 I faced him a fair amount uh, when he was in Oakland. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, he was a good hitter. Big, you know, he took up the, you know, he, Canseco, Dave Parker, uh, who's the other guy I can't think of right now? Dave Winfield. Parker and Winfield in the batter's box. I mean, it was like there was no batter's box. They took up the whole <laughs> batter's box. And the bat in their hand looked like a wiffle ball bat. I mean, it was, early in my career, it was a little intimidating to see that come into the batter's box. I mean, yeah. they, 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 yeah, big men, right? Big, strong men. Um yeah, but I don't. I can't say I was intimidated, but it was like. Ooh. Do you pitch differently to a guy like that compared to the standard? Well, I, you know, again, I, I was in a different. T you know, early in my career, I probably nibbled like crazy to those guys. Yeah. Right. Didn't understand. You know, Frank Thomas was another guy that took up a lot of the batter's box. But there's a guy that you know, to me, wanted the ball away, 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 away. You had to try to pitch him in. Yeah. You know. And he would always jump out of the way. I think that was a whole setup with the umpire. And the ball could be that far off the plate, and he'd jump back like you were throwing it at him. Yeah. You know, and then he'd look at the umpire. <laughs> He's know. trying to establish this strike zone right, himself. because he wanted the ball away. Yeah. And and most hitters do. Not all, but Mo, Joe Carter, you know, he wanted the ball away. Um, you know, depending on, you know, there's, there's a couple, you know, you can come around the ball or you can stay inside the ball. Joe Carter was to me was a guy that came around the ball, and he had a hole inside. Mm -hmm. But you had to get it to the hole. If you made a mistake, you hit it. Yeah. So I mean that you know, those are things that I learned over the course of early in my career. I had no idea about any of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Daryl Strawberry, another good hitter. Um, Dale Murphy. I mean, I'm aging myself, but I don't care. I mean, it, you know. Some of these guys are Greg Lazinski, Vaughn Hayes. You know, people are, who, what? You know, these guys, good players, good players. Uh, Glenn Davis, back when he played in Houston. Um, boy, I'm missing so many guys. Um, but, yeah, it's just Lance Parrish, another real big guy. Um, had a couple of really good years. But yeah, it, it's you know, you, you, you know now you got my mind going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that and that's the fun of it, you know. I love talking baseball, and mm -hmm. just reminiscing and the people, you know, the experiences and the and the people that I the experience I had and the people that I was able to play with and against, pretty cool, pretty yeah, cool, absolutely. And I love how being able to just the information that is out there nowadays. Cause you know, as you mentioned, you didn't hear tunneling until you were mm -hmm. 10 years into your yeah. career. Now any high schooler right, right, can go on right, YouTube and learn right. how to throw these different pitches yep. and just yep. the amount of education. Well, that's and you're out saying they now. didn't, the guys aren't thrown to a catcher. And I've seen some of that on social media and I'm like, 
Oh, that would be horrible. I, I personally don't like it, but George Kirby, he's yeah. in the same. You know, if it works, it works. But <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I want to see right. the ball cross the plate. I want to see it caught. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, there were times where I'd, you know, in bullpens, I might even have the catcher come up and sit right behind the plate so I can see what the ball's doing or where it is in proximity on the plate as it's crossing the plate. Because obviously during the game, he's got to sit back because there's a hitter there. Right. But sometimes judging that, seeing that, it, 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 it's, you know, it's, it, it has two different looks, right? With no hitter there swinging, you don't really, you know, like to me, you know, after game, you know, oh, you had good stuff today. Mm, why did I have good stuff? Well, you got people out. That doesn't mean I had good stuff. Mm-hmm. You're asking two human beings to do something. You're asking me to throw a ball, and you're asking him to have a round bat and hit a round baseball <laughs> moving in two to three different directions. Right. A lot of things have to go well for the hitter to have success, and a lot of things have to go well for me to have success. Right. So did I have a good day because they hit it at somebody? I'm not looking at it from that perspective. If I had a good day, I hit my locations. I changed speeds well. However, if I did that and gave up six runs in three innings and said, oh, I had a good day, you'd look at me and go, what, are you crazy? Right. Because you're looking at results, right? right? But I'm looking about at execution. And guess what? I'm thinking I executed, but so did they. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just right? have to tip the cap. Exactly. Yeah. But I can't come out and say, oh, yeah, I had a good day, and I gave up six. Right. Right? But I can. I know inside, you know, I, I, I understood inside where I was coming from. Yeah, I, the results, and that's all that matters is results. So don't get me wrong. I didn't think, oh, you know, I only went three innings and had a good day. No, I didn't because I didn't do my job, right? Mm -hmm. Or the day where I had horrible stuff and went seven. Oh, you had a good day today. I'm kind of like biting my lip. Yeah, I had a good day because I got results, Mm -hmm. right? But I didn't execute anything. Yeah. And they hit it right at somebody. Or I made a great play was made for me, right? So it, it, it's such a fine line, I think. And that's, to me, that's what makes this game such a wonderful game to play. Absolutely. And competitive. You know, it, it's really, yeah, and, and everybody has their own perspective of good and bad and right and wrong. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's, and there's not a right way or a wrong way. It's your way. Mm-hmm. But does it fit into what's happening? Or how does that fit in? Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned, you know, wanting to see what the ball looks like at the front of home plate. When I'm up in Seattle, I always watch the pregame bullpens. Mm-hmm. And you go out to the bullpen? Yeah. Awesome. So I love that. It's amazing in T-Mobile Park because you're yeah, able to get yeah, right behind the yep, catcher. Yep. Unlike a lot of stadiums. And yep. so, yeah, Cal Raleigh will be at the very front of the plate for the first couple of catches. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the pitcher will tell him move back. Right. And then he'll start throwing. Yep. So, yeah, I've, I'm always really focused on exactly what they're doing and why. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's why I, I personally love pitching. Mm-hmm. Um, I still play adult league in Portland. Okay. And Good for a, a, you. attempt to pitch. Awesome. Well, <laughs> next time you're doing it, watch because the wall behind is either green or black. Yep. Used to green. be green. Yeah, it's green. Okay. Um, see if you can pick out a cinder block on that wall. And see if his hand's coming off the of same that spot. same spot of that cinder block. Okay. Or use the fence, because there's a chain link fence between you and them. Right. Use the fence to line. Mm-hmm. That's like in the dugout. If I'm watching my own, one of my own teammates, or if I'm watching an opposing pitcher, if I'm trying to look for something, I'll sit on that bench that's in a lot of the dugouts, and I'll use the, the netting okay. in the fence, because the netting's not moving. And I'll use it as my starting point to, and see if the guy's drifting or see yeah. where his body is. There, there's two or something behind him. 
if there's something that you can line it up to. If they're tipping pitches. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I actually stuck my phone on the chain link fence, mm -hmm. and so I record some of their bullpens, mm -hmm. and put it on YouTube. Awesome. Just because, like when I draft someone in fantasy baseball, <laughs> okay. I want to I want to go watch their bullpens yeah. and see their pitches yeah. moving. Yeah. You Darvish with eight different pitches right. moving all these different directions. Well, and that's the, so. Here's the other thing, you know, and I'm not gonna knock you for this, but you know, I I, you know, I, I did a little bit of broadcasting for the Phillies after I retired. And I can remember sitting in the booth and talking. You, know, you have to, as the game's starting, you have to talk about the starting pitcher and what pitches he has. And, and then I would sit and I'd watch and I'd see a lot of inconsistency with the pitcher, right? And then I'd go back and think like, all right, pregame, I'm talking about five different pitches the guy throws. And he doesn't throw any of them overly consistent. So... My question would be, okay, if you throw five, what if you took away two and ended up with three and really put some time and effort into those three and made those three above average major league pitches? Mm -hmm. I think with creativity and being able to throw them to both sides of the plate, now you have six. Makes sense. Or, or would I rather be mediocre with, say, four and maybe have one good – my fastball is my best pitch. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because then you use those th same three pitches, both sides of the plate. Right. You could play them differently. And then say you have a fastball. So you have a four seam and two seam, right? Can you take a little bit off of the one that's away to the hitter? So now you have another pitch, a different speed. So it's about... The weapons you have and the repertoire that you have and how you use it as a weapon, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I keep going back to Kirby because he's able to, like, you can see him, like, thinking up on the mound mm -hmm. of, like, okay, I want the ball to do this. Mm -hmm. I need to hold it like this. Mm -hmm. And Robbie Ray taught him how to throw a two-seam in a, in a side bullpen, and mm -hmm. then he breaks it out throwing a 99 front door two seem to show mm -hmm. Otani to strike him out. Right. It's like this guy just right. knows the mechanics and the physics yep. of what you need to do yep. to manipulate manipulate the ball. Yep. And like you were describing with your two seam, you would slow it down at times, you know, right. tilt your hand a little more, mm -hmm. slow it down. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's knowing how to do that kind of stuff or you know, like say, you know, people I people say, Oh, you had three speeds in your change up. I'm like, I didn't have three, but I might have had two. And on a good day I'd throw my normal change up and I'd push. And if I want to take something off of it, I would fall and not push mm -hmm. and take just a little bit more off of it. Yeah. You know, because early in my career, they would teach you to take off speed of a change up to drag your back foot. And I couldn't push and then drag. I, I, I couldn't comprehend that exertion and then drag it leave it kind of hanging behind me so then as i got deeper into my career i'm like all right what if i just get here and just don't push mm -hmm. it's like hmm kind of interesting fall. yeah 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 so i mean it's just little things like that that you tinker with right because to me as a pitcher you're always tinkering you're not making wholesale changes because even with any player you know like You've been a talented athlete, and you have a lot of gifts. So I can tinker with those gifts a little bit, and I can fool around with them. But, you know, maybe it's not right for me now, but it kind of feels okay, but I can't grasp it. But then, well, let me work on, on the flat ground. Let me work on a grip. or Let me work on, you know, movement or throwing to the other side of the plate, you know, things like that. I mean, yeah, I see with a lot of kids, like a lot of young kids – they go, well, I, don't, I can't get the ball to my glove side. I'm like, what do you mean you can't get it? And I, I was one of those guys too, right? Well, first of all, you use the word can't. Mm -hmm. So I say, I stop and say, well, you have to delete the word can't from your vocabulary. You can. They look at me like, well, how do you know I can? So, all right, I go tell the catcher, move into the batter's box. Say it's a lefty and he wants to throw into a righty. Mm -hmm. 
tell the catcher, move into the right-hander batter, to the back corner of the right-hander's batter spot. Now say, tell the pitcher, throw it to him. Boom, boom. Okay, so that's really behind him. So how, why are you telling me you can't get it in? So now we're going to play a trick on our mind. Keep throwing it there, keep throwing it there, keep throwing it there, keep throwing it there, keep throwing it there. Tell the catcher, all right, move back one body width. Throw it there, throw it there, throw it there. Move another body width. Boom, boom. Now you're back to the corner. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Yeah. You just have to have the right thoughts. Right. And really, for me, ultimately, to do that, you got to stay with the ball a click or two longer to stay behind the ball and you got to reach and you got to reach through that. Right. But it's, it's, it can be that, that's pretty simple, right? It's no mechanical change. It's, it's just staying with it a little longer and reaching, getting through it and, and trusting. Cause you know, when you're talking with younger kids, they don't tell you, but you know, darn well, they don't want to hit that guy. Right. This well, guy. we got to practice. You're not just going to wake up and have it, mm -hmm. right? You got to practice. But what you're doing is you're tricking your mind. And you're, you're not saying, I can't. I can. Mm -hmm. I will. I know how to. And yeah. naturally, I think, naturally, when we go inside, we naturally throw harder. It's just a natural instinct. It's like w when you're throwing up. Mm -hmm. Naturally, mm -hmm. if you let it rip a little more, it's probably going to yep. be a little elevated. Yep. So, I mean, just little things like that, that, you know, but I mean, I've seen guys that I've played with professionally. I can't, you can. So when you were pitching, what were your cues? Were you looking at different spots on the catcher? Uh, or in just, just in the strike zone in general it, to start it, your it, pitch it, at? It, it varied. It varied. I, you know, there were times in games, and I learned this really late in my career. There were times in games where, like I've told you, I needed to be down, and I wasn't down like I needed to be. And I'd be like, "Why is this? Ha you know, mechanically, I feel right. I feel like I'm releasing the ball correctly, but my eyes, I felt like subconsciously drifted mm -hmm. up. So what I started to do." I took my eyes and I took them to the back point of the plate. Okay. And that's what I'd look at. And the next pitch would be down. Mm -hmm. And it's just so weird how that worked for and I've done it with a couple of kids and I've gotten the same results. Even I don't care if they spike it. Right. But you know, would you rather ball have the ball here? I mean, if you're looking for the ball down, would you rather have the ball here or here? How do I get there? So it's, where's my focus? I mean, I, you know, I see people that don't throw strikes. I said, like, what are you looking at? Well, I'm looking at home plate and the catcher. I'm like, what do you see? Well, I see the target. I see the catcher. I see the hitter. I see the umpire. So, well, that's part of your problem. You're throwing to a large space. Anybody can throw to that space, right? So, and you see it with more of the tan gloves than you do the black catcher's mitt. But usually, a catcher has a worn spot in his glove, and it's darker. Mm -hmm. Focus on that spot. See, you know, now I got my, my telescope out, and I'm looking into that brown spot. Now... Your focus goes from this to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just and it's it's mind stuff, you know, and stuff that's going on in your mind, what you think you're doing versus what you're actually doing. Yeah, and at that level, at the professional level, that's what that's you've got to be that. And I mean, not I mean, there's other people that are just gifted and talented that can just, <laughs> you know, you know, come out. Get out of bed and get off the training table and hit, yeah. right? Or pitch or run or whatever it is. Those are the immortals. <laughs> what do us mortals do, right? Right. right. I mean, it's, 
you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, watching some guys pitch, I'm like, well, they need to get called up to the next league. <laughs> they were immortals, you know, for me. I mean, it's, and it was a joke, right? But I mean, it's like, wow, that's impressive. You know, I want, you know, I'd say to myself, I wonder what that feels like. Like pay, watching Pedro in his prime. Right. I mean, it was like he had a wiffle ball. And he could throw any pitch in any situation. Cutter at 100. Yeah. And if he got upset with you, eh, I'll just knock you down. <laughs> right? I mean, that to me, you know, I mean, think about it. You know, let me ask you a question. What is the definition in your mind what a number one pitcher is? Overpowering stuff. That's, Everybody's that's, got that. That's first and foremost, like overpowering stuff. Everybody's got that. Locates, knows how to sequence pitches, the tunneling, like a Jacob deGrom to where he's, you know, 93 slider, lower, low outside yeah, he, corner. And then he also has that 100 mile an hour fastball. How many times a year do you see Jacob right deGrom pitch? Well, now, not very often because he's hurt all the time. In the last 10 years, how many times have you seen him pitch in a season? How many times have I seen him? How many times has he pitched? I don't know the exact number, but it's definitely not as high as it could be. You can talk about all that wonderful stuff, and I, it, right. I'm not discounting it. Right. But he's not healthy. For sure. Right? And it's unfortunate because he'd be a wonderful pitcher if he was healthy. So I'll say right? Luis Castillo then, or Spencer Strider right now. A number one for me is a guy that goes out and stops that losing streak. You've lost four in a row. Bam. Mm-hmm. Right, he can. He has that ability, and the rest speaks for itself. I right. think, right? How many number ones are in the game today that are actually proving it? They're legit number ones, like ten or less. That are that are when they're starting. Mm -hmm. That team's probably winning today. Right. Yeah. That's that to me. That's uh, you know, in a rotation. That's what you're looking for. Right. And maybe that number one isn't number one, and maybe your number three all of a sudden turns into a number one for a month. Right. Right? Maybe he's not a, you know, but on paper, you're going, okay, here are my five guys. Why is this guy number one? And why is this guy not number one? Right. Because he can or he can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And I think that's some of what the game is missing. Now, I'm... You come back to me and say, well, how many were there when you played? You know, I don't know that there were, I mean, but there, I mean, there, I did play with some guys that were, you know, that were that Ben McDonald, Mike Messina, Nolan Ryan, Dwight Gooden, Tom Seaver, uh, Steve Carlton. I mean, some of these guys, Sandy, Co you know, I didn't play with Sandy Koufax or against him, but, um, you know, they say, you know, Bob Gibson, you know, yeah. Some of these guys were just and, – and some of these guys were nasty, but the game allowed that, right? That's that's how the game was being played. Yeah. Right Right or wrong, you know, today it would be looked at as wrong, but in that era it was accepted. It was yeah. part of the game. Right? Going in and breaking up double plays, today that's wrong. Right. But in that era – Plowing the was, catcher. Right. That was, that was okay. Yeah. So – and that's, you know, that's what separates the game. And I think that's what makes the game so different. It's the same game, but it's a different game. Right. Played differently, put it that way. For sure. I love it. I could talk all day yeah. about this stuff. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you one more question. Okay. The Mariners commercials. They were a blast. Yeah. When did those start? Were you a part of the creative process when no. coming up with? No, that was, uh, boy, the Copacinos. Uh, boy, I forget the gentleman's first name. Occasionally, we'll see them at the ballpark. Um, they, they, the, the creativity between the Mariners and them was was awesome. They, the commercials were fun to make, but the staff that they used to make them made it fun too. You, you know, you're doing this year after year, and you yeah. usually spend a couple hours making a commercial. Mm -hmm. I had a blast. I mean, there was a cameraman. He, uh, I forget his name, uh, Peter. Was his name Peter, maybe? I think it was. Um, he had a French, he was European, he had a French accent, yeah. a little short, heavy set guy. 
Um, he was great at what he did, but he'd get mad. So he would vent. And then there's this other guy, unfortunately, who's passed away. His nickname was Bumpy. And they would he'd be the runner for donuts. And, and so they'd kind of pick on him. But it was in fun. It was light. We had a freaking blast making those commercials. I and, and like I said, the cre- you know the ones that I was fortunate enough to be a part of, you know, I ended up being a roommate with the the Mariner Moose. Um, that was you know fun doing that. I mean, they literally had a four wheeler in a hotel hallway, um, and yeah, it was just yeah they they were all and like I said, all the players that they used it was. I I, I, st- I just sent one of my kids one the other day. It came up, and I sent them to all my kids. We all get a kick out of them. <laughs> the speed gun, ooh la la. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, that one showed up on social media not too long ago. Yeah. But, yeah, it, again, and it, for me, it played a role with the team and the community and the fans mm-hmm. because the fans would talk about just like we're talking here. Hey, I saw that guy. That was funny. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, you know, and it, there was a connection there. So it was really intelligent, smart, wise, good business choices. Uh, you know, why they stopped them, I don't know. I but, saw that uh, they're bringing them back. Oh, they are? Yeah, so Cal, Cal Raleigh, he's known, known mm-hmm. as the big dumper. Mm-hmm. And so there was some behind the scenes on Twitter, a photo of like a big dump truck uh-huh. with some of the starting pitchers okay. in the back. So. They're coming back. I don't know how many they're going nice. to be or what players, but right. I'm looking forward to those for yeah. sure. Yeah, that was, uh, they were a lot of fun. And, and initially I was like, oh. the first one I did, I had never done one, right? I was so bored, <laughs> so not into doing it. And actually I got to the point where like I wasn't a part of, you know, the, that, you know, what they were filming. So I laid down and was like laying on the ground. It was out on the field. And I was kind of moping and complaining. And they ended up putting that into part of the commercial. Oh, really? So, yeah. But it was, we had a we had a blast doing those. Yeah. Awesome. The one, actually, the one that just came to my mind right now, Jay Buner was taking batting practice. And all of a sudden, the ball goes up and in. He goes, hey, throw strikes. And the camera pans out. And it's this little kid. Saw we, Mr. Buner. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Really appreciate your time. All right. This is a blast. I enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again sometime. Sure. And uh, hope to see you up in, in Seattle. I don't know if you'll be up there for opening day. I don't have any plans to be. Okay. Cool. But I'm sure they're going to have a wonderful season. Um, sounds like they've got the makings of a great starting rotation, which will be exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully they have the pieces on the back end that can – merge together with that and maybe take a little pressure off the offense to having to score a lot of runs, even though, you know what, it's a game today where it's kind of gladiator baseball, you know, it's throw it as hard as you can and hit it as far as you can. Yeah. And if you strike out, who cares? In the past few years, they've been really reliant on the walks, home runs, yep. the strikeouts. They've get, gotten rid of some guys, only four out of the nine that are going to be in the right. starting lineup this year were in the starting lineup opening day. So mm-hmm. should be more consistency throughout mm-hmm. the lineup. But yep. it's a yeah, it should be exciting, roster. exciting baseball. Yeah, awesome. Yep. Well, thank you again, Jamie. Right. My pleasure. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank I you. enjoyed it. Out to center. This is great. It's way back. It is good.